When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who, when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith, declared, I could not be shaken. Hello, my friends. I'm Jared Halverson. This is Unshaken, and I'm thrilled to have you back for another week of Book of Mormon study. Today we'll be studying Alma chapter 32 through 35. Now, this may have been a week since we've studied last time, but don't lose sight of where we were last week. Alma 30 with Korahor, the ultimate Book of Mormon Antichrist, and Alma 31 with these apostate Zoramites who had descended from the Nephites, built their Ramiumptum, climbed their holy stand so that they could pray to God about themselves. It reminds me of the parable Jesus told of the publican and the Pharisee, both of whom were praying. And the Pharisee was praying to be seen of men. In fact, I love the phrase Jesus uses, that as he prayed with himself, like the Ramiumptum prayer, it really did seem more focused on self than trying to connect with God, as opposed to the publican, a person who Jesus' hearers would have naturally looked down upon, and yet in a good way, that publican looked down upon himself in true humility, meekness before God. Well, in Alma 31, we got to see the Pharisee praying. In Alma 32, we'll meet the publican, the humble, the lowly, the poor, who have a sincere desire to connect with God. But I really want us to focus on what these people are up against, what Alma and his companions are up against. Because it wasn't just the pride of those who were praying on the Ramiumptum. Remember what they said God had revealed to them? That there would be no Christ. That's what connects Alma 30 with Korahor with the Zoramites in 31. This antipathy against Christ. Not just lack of faith in him, but more of an open defiance. Now to set that stage, let me share this statement from President Harold B. Lee. And I'll confess, the first time I heard this statement, I didn't believe it. He was speaking in 1971 to a group of young adult Latter-day Saints, the rising generation in colleges across the nation being bombarded with the philosophies of men, some of which would have been pretty similar to the kinds of things the Korahor was teaching. This is what he said. Fifty years ago or more, when I was a missionary, our greatest responsibility was to defend the great truth that the prophet Joseph Smith was divinely called and inspired, and that the Book of Mormon was indeed the Word of God. But even at that time, there were the unmistakable evidences that there was coming into the religious world, actually, a question about the Bible and the divine calling of the Master himself. Now, fifty years later, our greatest responsibility and anxiety is to defend the divine mission of our Lord and Master Jesus Christ. For all about us, even among those who claim to be professors of the Christian faith, are those not willing to stand squarely in defense of the great truth that our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ, was indeed the Son of God. So tonight, he told these young adults, it would seem to me that the most important thing I could say to you is to try to strengthen your faith and increase your courage and your understanding of the place of the Master in the great plan of salvation. Like I said, when I first heard that statement from President Lee, I didn't believe it. People not believing in Jesus, that we'll have to defend him? What are you talking about? Everybody believes in Jesus. At least that had been my assumption. I thought I was still living in a world that reflected President Lee's first statement. We're here to defend Joseph Smith and the Restoration. No need to defend Jesus. But as I've gotten older, I can now see that President Lee was right. We talked about this a little last week, the difference between the historical Jesus versus the Christ of faith, and our need to defend the Christ of faith that he really is the living Son of Almighty God, that he really did atone for our sins, take upon him death, and then rise from the grave, that he lives and continues to minister to all of God's children through his infinite grace, and that he continues to lead his church upon the earth. That is one of the great purposes of the restoration of the gospel. I've always been haunted by the question Jesus asks in Luke chapter 18, verse 8. When the Son of Man cometh, Shall he find faith on the earth? There is vulnerability in that question. When I return, will people even care? Will they believe? Will they have faith in me? One of the great purposes of the restoration 
is to make sure that the answer to that question is a resounding yes. That's why the Book of Mormon is so saturated in the message of Jesus, to confirm the Bible's message that Jesus is the Christ. Far more important than giving secondary evidence that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God, the Book of Mormon is meant to give primary evidence that Jesus is the Christ, to convince the Jew and Gentile, all people, of the Savior's mission. In fact, one of the most fascinating books, in my opinion, to ever accuse Joseph Smith of being a fraud rather than a prophet was written 40 years ago by a man who claimed that Joseph Smith had just written the Book of Mormon himself. Forget translation by the gift and power of God. No golden plates, no angel Moroni, none of that. Just coming out of Joseph Smith's own mind. Now that's a pretty natural explanation for a lot of people who simply dismiss Joseph Smith's claims to have translated the Book of Mormon. But this particular author is fascinating what he was saying as far as why Joseph Smith would do this. He actually took the time to read enough of the Book of Mormon to realize this really is a religious message. I can't accept Joseph's prophetic claims, but he must have been a religious person. He doesn't seem to be doing this with ill intent. In fact, the exact opposite seems to be true. So this man's guess was maybe Joseph Smith wrote the Book of Mormon to actually build faith in Jesus Christ. Some kind of a pious fraud, as it's sometimes called. In fact, the title of his book was Mormon Answer to Skepticism, Why Joseph Smith Wrote the Book of Mormon. It since has been republished with a different title. But think about that. Mormon answer to skepticism. That Joseph was writing, making up this story. Why? Because people in his time period were losing faith in Jesus and the Bible, just like people are in our own. And that the Book of Mormon was Joseph's answer to that. Lucy Mack Smith, Joseph's mom, actually shares a fascinating detail in her history that even before her son Joseph was born, her husband, Joseph Smith Sr., had avoided organized religion. At one point, he was leaning towards the Methodists, like his son Joseph later would as well. And his father, who had a copy of Thomas Paine's Age of Reason, some might argue the most scathing attack against the Bible, against revealed religion, against Christianity itself that's ever been written, at least the most popular one ever written to a general audience, that book was spreading like wildfire in the late 1790s and early 1800s. And at one point, Joseph Smith's grandpa takes a copy of the Age of Reason and literally throws it at his son through the open doorway of his house, challenging him to read it and to avoid the Methodists and all organized religion for that matter. So in spite of the staunch belief and piety of Joseph Smith's mother, there was a skeptical strand that came into the family through grandpa and dad. Not skeptical of God, but skeptical of revealed religion and the claims to divinity that the Bible attaches to Jesus Christ. If that's the case in Joseph's own family and his surroundings, American culture at the time, then no wonder Joseph Smith would want to combat that, this author said, by writing a book that is so focused on Jesus Christ. The irony of that, I mean, I've read a lot of anti-Mormonism, but nothing quite like that one. Because on the one hand, I agree with him. The Book of Mormon really is the ultimate response to skepticism. He was right in that. What I disagree with is to think that Joseph Smith wrote it as a response. My firm belief is not that this was Joseph's response to skepticism, but it was the Lord's response to skepticism. And he empowered a young Joseph Smith to translate this book by the gift and power of God in order to defend the divinity of his son. So whether it's Jacob versus Sherem, or Abinadi versus King Noah and Amulon, Amulek versus Zeezrom, Alma versus Korahor, or as we'll see today, Alma and his companions versus the apostate Zoramites, the message has always been that Jesus is the Son of God, that he atoned for our sins, that he conquered both sin and death and rose again, and is still eager and active in ministering to our every need, lifting us homeward and heavenward. We'll see that message today. In fact, seeing a little bit of the end from the beginning, in Alma 34, the way Amulek begins his turn, he says in verse 5, We have beheld that the great question which is in your minds is whether the word be in the Son of God or whether there shall be no Christ. Of course that's the great question on their mind. Every Sabbath, they've been packing the synagogue to see people climb the holy stand and say that God has revealed that there is no Christ. 
Of course that's the question on their minds. But there is a great answer to that great question. And both Alma and Amulek will help us discover the answers to that question in the things that they teach them and us today. So go back to Alma 32 and let's start with verse 1. Having prayed for all that they would need back in chapter 31, all the comfort and strength and wisdom and power and success, and having been filled with the Holy Ghost to grant them all of those much needed gifts, they go forth. They begin to preach the word of God unto the people, entering into their synagogues and their houses, even preaching the word in their streets. So from the most public to the most private and everything in between, anywhere they could go, they preached. And after much labor among them, they began to have success. This did not come easily. But it did come among the poor class of people. Their success was specific to them. Those who were cast out of the synagogues because of the coarseness of their apparel. Remember what we saw about the Ramiumptum? Back in 3128, those who climbed the holy stand, those that filled the synagogue, were known for their costly apparel, their ringlets and bracelets and ornaments of gold, all their precious things that they ornamented themselves with. After all, if they're going to claim that they're better than their brethren, then they're going to need to look the part, right? And if you allow these kinds of people with coarse apparel to come in and share the holy stand with everybody else to fill the synagogue, talk about bringing down the average, right? Talk about giving the lie to these promises of prosperity. Talk about shattering the sense of superiority these Ormites would have had. Well, we can't have you come in and make the rest of us look like maybe we aren't better than everybody else after all. In fact, let's keep you outside. Then the differences really would be stark. There's a fascinating theology, if you want to call it that, that's rising in popularity in America as we speak. It's called the prosperity gospel. It's often taught by the most successful or most visible of televangelists. And it is exactly what it sounds like, a prosperity gospel. Have faith in God and he'll make you rich. Turn to him spiritually and he will reward you temporally. And often the size of the congregation or the size of the building that they meet in. Some have converted old NBA stadiums into churches for this cause. Sometimes it's the wealth of the pastor himself. All of these things are evidences that, see, God really does bless us. I sometimes worry that some of that even creeps into LDS culture. And that the reason so many Latter-day Saints are so heavily in debt or guilty of such conspicuous consumption, that it's that kind of this spiritual version of keeping up with the Joneses. The richer I am, the more righteous I look. I mean, poverty would be such a sign of non-blessedness. So I need to avoid coarse apparel at all costs. Costs being the operative term. So you see what these poor Zoramites are up against? Verse 3, they were not permitted to enter into their synagogues to worship God. They were esteemed as filthiness. Therefore they were poor, yea, they were esteemed by their brethren as dross, the part that's supposed to be skimmed off or cast out, burned away, so that only undefiled purity remains. Therefore they were poor as to the things of the world, and also they were poor in heart. The prosperity gospel would equate those two things, even though in reality the opposite is so often true. So often those who are poor as to the things of the world are rich as to the things of the Spirit. I think that helps explain a little what they call the shift of the center of gravity of Christianity towards the global south. South America, Africa, the Philippines, places that are typically richer in spiritual things than in temporal things. Poor in spirit in a good way, in terms of being humble and open, relying on God instead of the size of their bank account. Now Alma is teaching them in verse 4, a great multitude of them come those that were poor in heart because of their poverty as to the things of the world. And this is what they say to Alma in verse 5. One who was the foremost among them said unto him, Behold, what shall these my brethren do? For they are despised of all men because of their poverty, yea, and more especially by our priests. For they have cast us out of our synagogues, which we have labored abundantly to build with our own hands. And they have cast us out because of our exceeding poverty. And we have no place to worship our God. And behold, what shall we do? So it's not just the fellow people that were looking down upon them. It was the priests that looked down upon them most of all. Again, these people give the lie to their prosperity gospel. They puncture their sense of superiority. As far as priestcraft is concerned, they can contribute very little. 
So let's get rid of the dross so only the, the high rollers, the big spenders, will come to church. That'll fill the plate as we pass it around. We hate to have the wealthy have to question the chosenness of this people or second guess what they're spending all their money on. Costly apparel doesn't always feel quite as comfortable when those in coarse apparel are all around you. I even wonder if this foremost brother struggled with a little bit of pride of his own. I mean, in a society this stratified and with such a strong sense of superiority among the wealthiest, I can understand why there would be some aspirations to social mobility. Because notice how he begins it. What shall these my brethren do? They are despised because of their poverty. See, it even seems like he's distancing himself from them just a little. I mean, yes, they're my brethren. Yes, I'm one of them. But I am the foremost among them. I'm the best of the worst. I'm the richest of the poor. I'm the biggest of the small fish. Who knows? But by the end, I am grateful that he's fully acknowledged where he stands. It's no longer they and their. It's we and our. They've cast us out because of our exceeding poverty. We don't have anywhere to go. Even though we built the synagogue ourselves, sad that throughout so much of Christian history, those that literally built the cathedrals felt less welcome than others in entering them. And with the uniformity and requirements of worship we saw back in chapter 31, they have this sense that we're cut off from God. We cannot worship him because we're not allowed into our own synagogues. And so he asks on their behalf, what shall we do? I love the humility in that question. Help us. What are we supposed to do in our circumstance? In fact, when John the Baptist was crying repentance, this is in Luke chapter 3, in three different verses, various segments of his audience, when he's crying repentance, respond with, what shall we do? We do have a desire to change. You've pricked our hearts. What do we do now? The publicans asked it. The soldiers asked it. John, what do we do from here? How do we make the kinds of changes you're describing? When Peter preaches his message in Acts chapter 2, crying repentance to the Jews that had crucified Jesus. And what do they ask? Men and brethren, what shall we do? I love this sense of m building momentum. We want to go somewhere. We've, you've awakened us to that. But give us direction. I want to push the gas pedal. Will you please help me know where to turn the wheel? What Alma does next is amazing. Verse 6, when Alma heard this, he turned him about, his face immediately towards him. You see what he just did? He'd been teaching this large mixed audience. This great multitude of the poor comes to him. Now, there seems to be kind of two different bodies. Alma trying to preach what he thought was his target audience. Perhaps a sense of, if I can convert the leaders, then the followers will come aboard. But in this moment, he realizes, wait a minute. This isn't my intended audience. This one is. Because these people are not as prepared for the word as these ones are. And he literally turns his back on the people he started teaching. So that he can face immediately the people that are ready for his word. He beheld them with great joy. He beheld that their afflictions had truly humbled them and that they were in a preparation to hear the word. The pride and wealth of one group prevented them from accepting the word and the humility and afflictions of this other group prepared them to receive it. I remember sometimes wanting to tract in gated communities on my mission, but we couldn't get in unless we knew a member in that community that would give us the code or allow us to come in when we hit the intercom, we literally were locked out. And in my mind, it was such a fascinating metaphor. What a tragedy that their wealth was literally keeping messengers with the restored gospel out of their lives. We had no access to them. Well, among the poor, they were in a preparation to hear the word. So in seven, Alma says no more to the other multitude. This is when a missionary realizes that the person he's been teaching is not progressing at all. There really isn't a sincere desire to learn. And in one of the most difficult things that a missionary often has to do, they turn from them in search of people that are more prepared. Not to give up on that person permanently, of course, but in hopes that time and circumstances will change and that eventually they'll be prepared for the word as well. Now, because Alma 32 is such a famous chapter in the Book of Mormon, and most people are familiar with Alma's analogy of the seed, I want to start with that analogy here. 
Because what's happening is the Lord has been preparing the soil of these future saints. In fact, if we superimpose this story over the parable of the sower that Jesus teaches, what kind of soil characterized the people that would climb the Ramiumptum and talk about how much better they were than others around them? This would be seeds sown among thorns. The soil had great potential. It was fertile. It, a lot was growing there. Unfortunately, it wasn't good growth. It was the growth of weeds, thorns that were choking out the seed that the sower had planted. Jesus taught the parable of the sower in Matthew and Mark and Luke, and not only taught the parable, but also explained its meaning to the apostles. And if you combine those three accounts, this is what the thorns represented. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lusts of other things, and the pleasures of this life. Sound like the people who climbed the Ramiumptum? Sound like the people in the great and spacious building? Sound like King Noah's court? Sound like Korahor or anybody in the order of the Nehors? They could have done so much. The soil was good, but all their potential spiritual growth was being choked out as the strength of that soil was being diverted to lesser things. And what do you have to do in soil like that? You have to weed. You have to pull out things that were never meant to be there. Distractions and diversions to the strength that should be going to better things. That's what's been happening here. Again, that phrase in verse 6, their afflictions had truly humbled them. Their afflictions. God had been raking or hoeing, pulling out of these people. The opportunity to be choked by the deceitfulness of riches or the pleasures of this life. Alma saw this as a good thing. In verse 7, he cried unto those whom he beheld who were truly penitent. In 8, he tells them, I behold that ye are lowly in heart, and if so, blessed are ye. Your peers may be looking down on you. I look up to you. They may think of you as cursed, as unchosen. I consider you blessed. The brother just said, we're cast out of our synagogues. We can't worship our God. But I say to you, verse 10, do you suppose you cannot worship God, save it be in your synagogues only? Do you suppose you can only worship God once a week? That's become culture here. I get it. But that's not the way it's supposed to be. In fact, verse 12, it is well that ye are cast out of your synagogues. You little seeds, consider yourselves blessed that you have been uprooted and transplanted into other soil without so many distracting or diverting weeds, thorns that are choking your possibility of growth. It's so ironic. It's a good thing you can't go to church, he's saying to them. Have any of you felt that way during this time of COVID-19? Have you seen any good come of having been cast out of your synagogue because of quarantining? Has it prepared your soil in any way to grow in better directions Forcing you to sink your own tap roots a little bit deeper instead of perhaps leaching off of the sources of living water that other people have developed. A lot of good can come from being cast out of the synagogue. Good, at least, if it makes you humble. You see in verse 12, that you may be humble, that you may learn wisdom, for it is necessary that you should learn wisdom. It is because that you are cast out, that you are despised of your brethren, because of your exceeding poverty, that ye are brought to a lowliness of heart, for ye are necessarily brought to be humble. We talked about this back in Alma chapter 5, when he asked the people of Zarahemla, have ye been stripped of pride? Has someone come and pantsed you? Has, have they pulled the pride right off of you? Stripped you of it? Have you been humiliated? Or, better, have you chosen to be humble? Again, President Benson's famous statement, God will have a humble people. You can choose to be humble or you can be compelled to be humble. Stripped of pride or take it off yourself. Be humiliated or become humble. You see what the Lord is doing to break up this soil? He's uprooted and transplanted you, pulled you out of the synagogue, and he's broken up the soil through your afflictions, through your trials. That's why you're in a preparation to hear the word, because God has been working on your soil. Notice what he says in 13. Because ye are compelled to be humble, blessed are ye. For a man, sometimes, there's the catch, sometimes if he's compelled to be humble, he seeketh repentance. 
as opposed to those who humble themselves, who always seek repentance? But however you seek repentance, notice the next phrase, and now surely whosoever repenteth shall find mercy. I love the difference there. Compelled humility sometimes leads to repentance, but sincere repentance surely leads to mercy and forgiveness. And if you find mercy and endure to the end, you shall be saved. That's a surely rather than a sometimes also. So then in verse 14, if compelled humility is a good thing, then chosen humility is even better. And it comes about because of the word. The word that teaches you of Jesus. The word that elevates his pedestal to the point that we naturally kneel before it, recognizing our own difference and distance from God. 15, he that truly humbleth himself and repenteth of his sins and endureth to the end, the same shall be blessed. Yea, much more blessed than they who are compelled to be humble because of their exceeding poverty. This actually helps explain what President Boyd K. Packer once said that there is more equality in our trials than we realize, and that sometimes the most difficult trial is the apparent absence of any. Wait, what? The hardest trial is to not have any trials? Well, sign me up for that one, right? But think about it. If the purpose of life is to come to know God, and trials remind us of our dependence on Him, then trials are actually moving us forward towards the goal of our mortal existence. Whereas wealth often breeds complacency or an independence. Who needs God? I've got everything that I need. And that sense of self-sufficiency or complacency interferes with the purpose of our life, coming to know and rely upon God. So if difficult circumstances often compel me to look to God, they bring me to my knees, then it sounds like President Packer was right. How do we choose to go to our knees when circumstances are not compelling us to go there? How do we put our trust in God when there's plenty of flesh on our arm in which to place some trust? Now, he's not saying they're all that way. If you skip over to verse 25, he, he admits that. I do not mean that ye all of you have been compelled to humble yourselves. I verily believe that there are some among you who would humble themselves, let them be in whatsoever circumstances they might. There are those who choose to kneel, even without circumstances bringing them to their knees. People who are choosing humility without needing to be humbled. Back in verse 16, those are the most blessed of all. Blessed are they who humble themselves without being compelled to be humble. Just good, rich, deep topsoil that doesn't have to be raked and hoed and broken up and fertilized. All those great verbs from Jacob 5. It doesn't need to be digged and dunged and everything else. It's just ready for planting. In other words, Alma continues, Blessed is he that believeth in the word of God and is baptized without stubbornness of heart. And don't limit yourself to baptism there. Those that serve without stubbornness, that study scripture without stubbornness, that attend the temple without stubbornness. Remember section 58 of the Doctrine and Covenants. If you have to be compelled in all things, the same as a slothful and not a wise servant. These people were not slothful. They couldn't afford to be. They weren't unwise. Remember the wisdom they learned back in verse 12 because of their humility? This was soft clay. It could be molded and shaped. These were not hard or stubborn hearts that would need to be broken before they could be refashioned. They were turning their own soil. They didn't have to be plowed. And as a result, they didn't have to be brought to know the word or compelled to know before they would believe. Now with that phrase at the end of verse 16, we start to see something that's gonna occupy the rest of the chapter. The idea of knowing versus believing, or in this phrase, to be compelled to know. We've talked about compelled to be humble. Well, what does it mean to be compelled to know? It's interesting that knowledge can be compulsive. That is, I can force knowledge upon you. That's kind of what proof does, right? Once something is proven, then I, I, I have to acknowledge it, right? I've been forced into that acceptance. That's what Korahor was after. Prove it to me. You show me a sign. I will not believe by choice. I can only believe by compulsion. 
We talked last time about epistemology. How do we know what we know? We'll see a lot more of that in Alma chapter 32. Well, this is a compelled epistemology. You have to believe. It's been forced upon you. That doesn't say anything about the individual, right? That's the difference between those who are blessed on a higher level because they've chosen to be humble versus those whose circumstances have forced them into a humble posture. Well, to choose to believe versus being compelled to believe because signs have forced it upon you, that doesn't tell me anything about you at all. You had no choice in the matter. Isn't that the story of Doubting Thomas? The other apostles have seen the risen Lord, and they tell Thomas about it. He wants proof. Until I've seen for myself, put my finger into the prints of the nails, and thrust my hands into his side, I will not believe. Well, when the risen Lord comes and shows himself to Thomas, he says, fine. Have it your way. Be compelled to believe with proof that makes it impossible not to believe. Thrust your hand into my side. But he says to him, be not faithless, but believing. Again, a sense of your way of knowing, Thomas, is inferior to others' ways of knowing. More blessed are those who choose to believe without being compelled to know. That's what he says to him. Thomas because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. Theirs is a superior epistemology, spiritually speaking. Interesting that God even wants to preserve agency in the epistemological realm, in the realm of knowledge, because that gives us room to work, to make decisions, to exercise agency, to decide what we want to do or who we want to become. And when knowledge is compelled, then our accountability goes up as well. You have to know. You've, it's been forced upon you. You've got to live up to this. That's why asking for a sign was actually a bad idea on the part of Korahor. It raised his accountability, but it didn't change his heart because he never chose to. That knowledge was forced upon him. He was compelled to know because he demanded a sign that would force it upon him. So back to the plant analogy. You've been uprooted and transplanted to be get better soil. You're no longer among the thorns. Your afflictions and hardships have turned that soil. So you're not on rocky ground either. See what the Lord is trying to do. The good gardener is trying to move them further and further away along this spectrum, away from wayside soil that has no chance to receive the word. Turn the soil, that's rocky ground. Weed and uproot, that's thorny ground. Trying to get us all onto this side of the spectrum where the soil is good and ready for growth. But notice it's growth that God is after, not just the final product. Otherwise, you can like today, we can go to the nursery and buy a plant that's already grown, bring it home, and then plant it. Saves a ton of time, right? But if you're after growth instead of the final greenery, then that defeats the purpose of the whole thing. So forcing belief upon someone, compelling someone to know, that's buying the plant that's already grown and then sticking it into the soil. Haven't learned a thing about the soil yet. Haven't learned anything about the seed, anything about the plant. It's already there. It defeats the purpose of what we're seeing here. That's why in 17, he goes after that sign element that we saw in Korahor. There are many who do say, if thou wilt show unto us a sign from heaven, then we shall know of a surety. Then we shall believe. So Alma's remembering his experience with Korahor there. But then he asks in verse 18, wait, is this faith? I say unto you, Nay, for if a man knoweth a thing, he hath no cause to believe, for he knoweth it. Again, there was no growth in the plant. It was just an already grown plant that you stuck in the ground. Nothing changed in Korahor's soul, because nothing happened in his soil. Remember he said, Oh, I knew it all along. Isn't that fascinating? I had knowledge, but I lacked faith. Because faith is a condition of the heart, whereas knowledge is simply a condition of the mind. And God wants both. If we sidestep faith, if we short-circuit the process, and I just want to jump straight to knowledge, I just want to know. I want mental acknowledgement. I see that all the time with people who come in going through faith crisis. And they just want to get to this place of surety, of knowledge. Answer all my questions, resolve all my concerns, prove everything. It's like they've drawn a line across the neck and say, only speak above that line. Only talk to my head. I want rational, empirical proof. People don't tend to ask for supernatural signs, but they sure ask for rational, empirical signs all the time. 
I don't want to have to merely believe. Merely? Again, Alma seems to be suggesting that belief in some ways is even higher than knowledge because there's a choice there. Just like chosen humility is better than compelled humility. Chosen belief, faith, is superior, more blessed than compelled knowledge. Even when they demand reasons, I always quote to them that great verse in 1 Peter, to be ready to give to everyone that asketh thee a reason for the hope that is in thee. But catch the difference. You want reason, I get it, neck up conversation. But at the end of the day, I'll give you the reason for the hope that is in me. It's still hope, it's still faith, it's still belief. There is such divine restraint on the part of God to allow that space to exist. Sure, he could stick fully grown trees in every plot of ground. He doesn't. He scatters seeds so that we can learn something about our soil through the process. So we can learn something about seeds through the process. So we can learn something about the sower himself through the process. In your quest for perfect knowledge, which is not a bad quest to be on, have patience and faith through the process of growth because it's growth that God is after. Remember Jesus' question, will he find faith upon the earth? He didn't ask, will he find perfect knowledge? Because he could have provided it. Sign seeking is just Satan's temptation number two. Right? Jump off the temple and God will send the angels for this amazing save before you hit the ground. Won't even dash your foot against a stone and the world will know that you're the son of God. Isn't that what you want? To which Jesus basically responds, well, ultimately, yes. But before they know I'm the son of God, I need to give them time and space to simply believe that I am. I need to give them chances to exercise faith before perfect knowledge comes to put the stage of faith at an end. Again, in verse 19, the heightened accountability that knowledge brings, how much more cursed is he that knoweth the will of God and doeth it not than he that only believeth or only hath cause to believe and falleth into transgression. Either way, we're going to be imperfect. We will not do God's will. We will fall into transgression. But sinning against belief There's a lot more mercy there than sinning against perfect knowledge. So perhaps he's lengthening things, giving us time, like Alma taught back in chapter 12, to allow our faith to grow into knowledge simultaneously with allowing our works to grow into real reconciled wills. Faith growing into knowledge on one side, deeds developing disposition on the other. And both of those things take time. And if the one quickly outpaces, outdistances the other, it's like the branches outgrowing the roots in Jacob 5. That leads to a dead tree too. Let patience have her perfect work, James says. Let belief grow into knowledge through faith and let righteous acts grow into righteous reflexes through our works. Now in 21, he really gets to what he wants to talk about. As I said concerning faith, this is what we want to spend our time on. Faith is not to have a perfect knowledge of things. Those two are not synonymous. Faith can lead to perfect knowledge, but once you have perfect knowledge, you no longer have faith. We'll see this taught again in Ether chapter 3 with the brother of Jared. If you have faith, ye hope for things which are not seen, which are true. This hope element as opposed to unavoidable acknowledgement. Again, we get to see the heart here, what it wants, what it hopes for, as opposed to simply an enforced epistemology of the mind, acquiescence in the face of proof, rather than hope in the face of uncertainty. In 22, when he says, I say unto you, and I would that you should remember that God is merciful unto all who believe on his name. I love the word believe there. Therefore he desireth in the first place that ye should believe, yea, even on his word. The first thing God wants is our belief, not our acknowledgement, not our acquiescence, not our perfect knowledge. He wants our belief in the first place because it says something about our heart. It says something about our soil. 
Sadly, the word believe seems to have taken a hit in church culture. It seems like such a far cry from real knowledge. In our fast and testimony meetings, what do we say? I know, I know, I know. And if somebody says, I believe, it almost is like, e yeah, he or she doesn't know, huh? Hmm. Where's your faith? Well, actually, it's the other way around. Perhaps if all we ever say is, I know, I know, I know, maybe that's a time to ask, well, but where is your faith? If your faith has grown into perfect knowledge, that's one thing. That's a wonderful thing. But if you're claiming perfect knowledge, if that's just the word you use as a way to sidestep or short circuit the process of faith and hope growing into real knowledge, then we've missed something. I was doing research a few years ago on the earliest days of the church, and I was fascinated to see in a newspaper article somebody talk about these Mormon missionaries that had come into town. And they talked about some of the things they taught, but the newspaper article was most fascinated by this one word that the Latter-day Saint missionaries seemed to use a lot. The word was no, K-N-O-W. They said, yeah, the Mormon missionaries, they say they know these things are true. And that was so different from what the newspaper writer had expected that it stood out to him. It was like, they didn't say they believed. They didn't say they had faith. They said they knew. He even said, and that's a fair example of the Mormon slang. That's what he called it, the Mormon slang. Now, in defense of those early missionaries, I don't think it was just slang to them. Nor is it always slang when people say it in fast and testimony meeting. We can say we know, though we do say it using a different epistemological model than the narrowly contracted, confined scientific empiricism that Korahor was after, like we talked about last week. We can say we know, that we know by the witness of the Holy Ghost. That's what Alma does when he clarifies his own testimony back in Alma chapter 5. I know these things for myself, for I have fasted and prayed many days. The Holy Ghost has borne witness to my soul. Again, that's a different epistemological model than the kind of physical proofs that Korahor was asking for. Remember the blind scientists mixing paint color by touch and smell from Gulliver's Travels. We can't run this experiment with those senses. We'll never get measurements with those specific measuring rods. Spiritual truths are spiritually discerned. But once spiritually discerned, we can say that spiritually speaking, we do know. So it's not just Mormon slang. But sometimes, isn't it? Do we sometimes just say or hear people say, I know, I know, I know, without the faith and the hope that we were supposed to develop on the way to that knowledge? I think in a way we need to resurrect, redeem the word believe in the Latter-day Saint vocabulary. Because as Alma says here, God is merciful unto all who believe on his name. So in the first place, believe, work on faith, develop hope, want to believe, he'll say in a moment. And if you're not even there yet, then want to want to. In a beautiful talk that Elder Holland gave years ago called, Lord, I believe, there was his key verb, he talked about a young boy, 14 years old, I think, who met Elder Holland and said, Elder Holland, I don't think I can say yet that I know the church is true, but I do believe it. And it was so apologetic, like, ah, I, I don't have the right vocabulary word yet. This is all I'm at. This is my level. And Elder Holland said that I hugged that boy until his eyes bulged out. I told him with all the fervor of my soul that belief is a precious word, an even more precious act, and he need never apologize for, quote, only believing, unquote. You see the beauty of belief on the way towards knowledge, but before it gets there, that's what allows faith to flourish and to function. That's the growth element we're talking about instead of just transplanting trees. Some people have argued that doubt is not the opposite of faith. Doubt is actually what allows faith to function. It's what clears out space, makes room for faith to develop. Now let me say something about this briefly. 
because I remember hearing from one of the leaders of the Church Correlation Department a few years ago. Correlation Department is the group of doctrinal experts that make sure that there is a uniform and clear doctrine throughout the church in its curriculum and its teachings and so on. We don't want to be blown about by every wind of doctrine, and correlation helps guard against that. But this leader pointed out that the brethren were a little concerned about the glorification of doubt that was slowly creeping into certain elements of the church. Now this is a fine line we need to walk. So let's see if we can walk it together. On the one hand, we would never want people to feel like their questions are unwelcome. If any of you lack wisdom, any of you, let him ask of God, James says. It's the verse that started the whole restoration, right? Questions are welcome. You don't have to know everything. In fact, the ninth article of faith lets us know that we don't know everything yet. There is yet much to be revealed, many great and important things that we don't know yet. Expect questions. God hasn't told us everything yet. That's okay. That's, that's exciting, actually. Revelations yet to come. So we don't want to swing the pendulum so far in that direction to say, oh, no, no, doubt is unwelcome. Questions not allowed. No, questions are always allowed. Bring them, please. But do we swing the pendulum so far in that direction that we start reveling in doubt, almost trying to avoid answers or testimony, where not only I know is a dirty word, but even I believe sounds a little too dogmatic. And then this leader pointed out something that I'd never noticed before. He said, our only concern with this subtle glorification of doubt is that in the scriptures, doubt is never mentioned positively. When Peter walks on the water and then starts to sink, and Jesus says, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Wherefore means why, right? So why would you doubt, Peter? You were doing it. After Jesus curses the fig tree, he says to the apostles, If ye have faith and doubt not, you'll not only do this, but da 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 da. When Peter is sent to Cornelius in the book of Acts, he's told to go with them, doubting nothing. One of the clearest is in section 6 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Look unto me in every thought. Doubt not. Fear not. This leader was right. In the scriptures, doubt is never glorified. Instead, whenever the Lord talks about it, he tells us not to do it. So now, wait a minute. I'm not supposed to have questions? No, no, no. You're not supposed to have doubts. Wait, what? Isn't that the same thing? What about the things I just don't know? Or even the things I don't believe? Areas where my faith is lacking or my testimony is weak? Is doubt really not allowed in the church? Honestly, I think much of this is a semantic issue, the word that we use. And the more that I've studied it, I realize that whenever the Lord is condemning doubt, it's doubt as a verb. He doesn't use doubt as a noun. We do. We talk about, I have my doubts. And we use it almost like it's synonymous with questions, places of uncertainty in our faith. I don't know about this part of church history, or I always wondered about this. This part doesn't make sense to me, or this I just don't understand. And we label all of those our doubts. That's doubts in the plural, and they're nouns. Propositional doubt, things I can't check off the box and say, yes, I believe that. But in the scriptures, it's always doubt as a verb that Jesus condemns. Doubt not, but be believing. Wherefore couldst thou doubt? He's not talking about questions or uncertainties. Bring those to him. Come and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Let's talk about those things. Let's work on those. This is a great opportunity for you to develop faith as your uncertainty becomes certainty, as your question marks become exclamation points. Bring them, please. So the Lord isn't condemning questions, doubts, plural, as in propositions. He's condemning doubt as a verb, or as a singular noun, just doubt in general. Because that's something that then kind of creeps into us and becomes how we view things. It becomes our attitude. See, shift from propositional doubt to attitudinal doubt. What I mean by that is, instead of, here's my list of questions, keep the list, but rather, here's my attitude of doubt. That's the part that the Lord wants to help us grow out of. That's why in section 90 of the Doctrine and Covenants, he says, search diligently. I know there's questions. <laughs> Bring them. So search diligently. Pray always. Use both the head. That's the search diligently part. Use the heart. 
That's the pray always part. Bring your questions. Come and talk about these things. The conversations you have with God over these things will be life-changing. But then he adds this phrase. Search diligently, pray always, and be believing. See, that's attitude. He's not saying just, just check out all the boxes even if you don't know. No, but have an attitude where those boxes will eventually be checked. That's why I label those questions the third part of the ninth article of faith. Things that God has yet to reveal. But I believe he will reveal them. That's my attitude. That's my faith. I think sometimes we picture kind of this box. And there's a line somewhere in the middle that separates the things that we know. Kind of the weighty parts of our testimony that sink down to the bottom. And this is my bedrock foundational belief. My, my knowledge. My testimony. Everything above it. That line is, that's my doubts. I, I just, I don't know that stuff. So faith below the line and doubt above the line. But again, God acknowledges there are things I have not yet told you. That third element of the ninth article of faith is key. It's what gives us room to grow and develop in our faith and our hope. Otherwise, we would be compelled to know. And with that comes great accountability. He wants to give us time to grow. This is the mental version of what Alma taught back in chapter 32. The space, the time being prolonged, the gap that opens up between the fall and the atonement, between the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil and the fruit of the tree of life. It's what makes this a preparatory state. And that third part of the ninth article of faith, God will yet reveal many great and important things pertaining to the kingdom of God. That's what that space is. That space allows me to exercise faith. That's the good of uncertainty. So don't label that doubt. If you want to stick with our box diagram, doubt is not all that empty space up above. Doubt and faith are actually what are playing tug of war along the line itself that separates our certainties from our uncertainties. You see, the certainties and uncertainties are all those propositional things. Here's the stuff that I can check the boxes on. And here, up here are the things that I can't. But faith is what pushes the line upward. Faith is trusting that God will yet reveal those things. Whereas doubt is what brings the line downward. Doubt as an attitude where I don't believe that God will ever reveal those things. I don't think they can be known. That was Korahor for you. You cannot know of things to come. You cannot know these things. How do you know? So many epistemological questions and accusations that Korahor threw in Alma's face. That attitudinal doubt pushes the line down, increasing the space of uncertainty and almost gobbling up the things that were certain to you before. That's what happens with faith loss. We forget what we used to know. And I mean that actively, not passively. We choose to forget. We eliminate those things that we once knew. Doubt has moved the line down. God doesn't reveal. We cannot know. Faith moves the line up. God does reveal. He will yet reveal. I can know. And the further my faith pushes that line upward, the more things will move from what God has not yet revealed above the line, to what he is now revealing to me, what's on that line, to what he already has revealed to me, which is what's below that line. Those are the three areas of the ninth article of faith. Revelations future, revelations present, and revelations past. Hope fills the top section. Faith fills the middle on that line. And knowledge fills the bottom section. That's part of the process of growing up in God, coming to know by having time to believe. Now, from this moment on and for the rest of this chapter, Alma is going to help them in this process of moving the line of faith so that hopes can become beliefs and eventually become perfectly known truths. And ironically, he's going to put it in terms of an experiment. It's what an empiricist would want, right? That's what a Korahor would demand. Show me a sign. So Alma's like, okay, fine. I'll, I'll see your demand. But it has to be done in the right way. We will use the scientific method, but not as so narrowly defined by rational empiricism. There has to be room for a non-rational, not to say irrational. That's what they typically want to do. That's why they mock, like we talked about last time. 
They want to make all the non-rational look irrational, as if that's the only other option to rationality. So much of life is non-rational. Think beauty. Think love. So much of humanity. That's why we talk about the sciences and the humanities. The sciences want to confine themselves to pure rationalism. The humanities allow themselves to grapple with the non-rational. But a narrowly defined or confined scientism wants to say, nope, if it's not rational, then it's irrational. And we will mock it and make you feel like an idiot. So in this particular experiment, we need to make room for the non-rational. We could call it the super-rational, the above reason alone, where so many of the humanities dwell. So much of what makes us human. Go try to have a personal relationship with someone based on rationalism alone. Good luck in that marriage. But like the scientific method typically demands, this experiment will be verifiable. It will be repeatable. This experiment has proven successful throughout history, across cultures, through an incredibly wide variety of people. The experiment works if we will do it the way the Lord has explained it. And like so much of the scientific method, there is an element of observation. How have people received testimonies in the past? The scriptures are our opportunity to learn that. There is a hypothesis, some sort of con conjecture, saying based on the observations that we've made, what I see in scripture, what I've experienced in my own life, that if I do these things, then truth can be confirmed to my soul. There is a prediction, some set of expected consequences, that if I do these things based upon my hypothesis, then this should be the result. And then there's the experiment. Try it then. See. It's that attitude of faith that expects the line to move. God will reveal truth to me. He'll confirm it to my soul through the power of the Holy Ghost. So let's take this experiment. He calls it that in verse 27. But start in verse 23. God imparts his word by angels unto men. Not only men, but women also. And not only men and women, but little children to have words given unto them many times which confound the wise and the learned. In other words, this experiment that I'm about to explain is open to all. This is part of that repeatability or verifiability. It's open to anyone, men, women, children. You don't have to be the wise and the learned even. You don't need sophisticated equipment. You will not be limited by the coarseness of your apparel, your lack of opportunities for learning. This is an experiment open to all. In 26, he adds, Now, as I said concerning faith, that it is not a perfect knowledge, even so it is with my words. You cannot know of their surety at first unto perfection any more than faith is a perfect knowledge. That's what makes this an experiment instead of an already proven fact. That's why we're going to plant a seed instead of simply transplant an already grown tree. And like we said earlier, the Lord wants growth, not just greenery. When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth, not just a bunch of checked boxes that everyone has acknowledged belief. It takes faith, not perfect knowledge, to love someone that seems undeserving of that love. It takes faith, not perfect knowledge, to give with no hopes of return. It takes faith, not perfect knowledge, to engage in acts of selfless sacrifice. It takes faith, not perfect knowledge, to become like Jesus. Remember what James says, the devils believe and tremble. They know, but their perfect knowledge never translated into faith. That principle of action, of power. So quit demanding your signs and quit trying to jump ahead to perfect knowledge. Let patience have her perfect work. Let faith grow into perfect knowledge. And here's how we'll do it. 27. First thing, awake and arouse your faculties. This discovery is not going to come to a casual dabbler. We need serious scientists for this particular experiment. Awake and arouse your faculties, even to an experiment upon my words. And exercise, there's another active word, right? Exercise. It's going to take work on our part. Maybe that's another reason that signs are so tempting, because it gets us to what we thought was the destination through a shortcut. 
We took steroids instead of working out. We took pills instead of dieting. We bought a diploma online instead of actually going to school. Now, this particular experiment, the exercise is part of it. It's part of what produces the result at the end. I shake my head sometimes when people say, oh, the church isn't true. When it's the person who has stopped being true to the church, do they drive past a gym that they haven't been to in years and say, oh, the gym just isn't true? Well, it is for everybody that's in there actually exercising. Try the experiment. Awake, arouse your faculties, exercise, and you'll see the difference that the gym can make. Here he asks us to exercise a particle of faith, just a particle. So he wants to take this to the atomic level. He can't think of anything smaller than that, just a particle of faith. Yea, even if you can no more than desire to believe, then let this desire work in you even until you believe in a manner that you can give place for a portion of my words. I love how easy Alma is trying to make the first step. It won't stay easy. This is exercise. This is awake and arouse your faculties, right? But to begin, just get off the couch, or at least want to. I actually had a conversation with a student this last semester. Awesome young woman, but really struggling in her faith and spirituality. She felt that she had fallen very far since her mission. And the worst part of it was, she didn't really seem to care much. She said she was staying in the church, partly because leaving it would devastate her family. But in a moment of pretty brutal honesty, she said, and part of it, I'm just too lazy to even leave. So we talked about this verse, and she asked the most honest question, what if you don't even have that desire yet? What if a particle of faith is still more than what I can muster. Is there anything smaller than a particle? Is there like an electron of faith? Is there like a quark of faith? And we wrestled with that for a while. Knowing that this young woman was an adventurer, an outdoors woman, I asked her if she did much biking, and she does. So we talked about how many gears are on a bike, and that if you're starting from zero, especially if you're on an uphill incline, what gear do you start? And typically we start in the lowest possible gear. A lot of movement on the legs without a lot of movement on the road. Why? Because it makes it so much easier. Yes, I'm moving my legs a lot, but not with a lot of force behind them. That low gear allows me to just start moving, barely. But once I start moving, then I can shift up, go to the next higher gear, a little more muscle than before, but not a ton. And I'm making a little bit more progress than I was before. And if I continue that momentum and shift up again, then it's this process of adding a little more effort as time goes on and getting incredibly more results in the process. Well, this was making perfect sense to her. So then I asked her the important question, what is your lowest gear? That's going to be different for everybody. For some, the easiest thing they can do is pray. For others, that takes a lot of effort and focus. Some people can just jump right into scripture and go from zero to 60 and 2.5. Speaks their language. Others, it's like, whoa, I don't, I never understand what's going on in here. That is a high gear. And it's really hard just to plop the book open and dive in. Everyone's different. So I asked her, in your case, what is your absolute lowest gear? Something that takes barely any effort, hardly any desire. It almost comes automatically. But it does allow you to feel a particle of faith start to work within you. Some inkling of God. And as she thought about it, she said, nature. Just being outside. And I smiled and responded, isn't it generous of God to surround you? with your lowest gear. In fact, I don't think you're alone in that one. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Psalm 19. Isn't that what Alma was kind of getting at with Korahor? All of this denotes that there is a God. It's meant to just spark that particle of faith. Get the tiniest bit of momentum going as you're out in nature and just seeing something within you, some stirring of the soul, a sense of awe, a feeling of transcendence. 
of wonder. I then said to her, the next time you're out in nature and you start to feel some momentum, recognize that momentum for what it is. That a desire is beginning to work in you. A particle of faith is present. But don't just acknowledge it. Try to build on that momentum and shift up a gear. What would your next one be? Is it time to pray yet? Maybe not. Maybe your second gear is simply gratitude for the creation that you see. You're in it, first of all. But something's starting to stir. Well, make it more of a conscious, mindful acknowledgement of the beauty that you're seeing. Be in it. Occupy that space. Be mindful. Feel gratitude. Even if you're not ready to actually express it yet. Maybe that's the third gear. I don't know. But I challenged her. Brainstorm as many things as you possibly can of ways that you feel the Holy Ghost. Just get them as many out on paper as you possibly can. That's the first step. And then the second, see if you can rank them from easiest to hardest, from lowest gear to highest gear. It's almost like you're trying to build this spiritual bike and you have all kinds of gears. Just brainstorm as many as you can. Just gather as many gears as possible. Big ones, small ones, lots of teeth, fewer teeth, and then start assembling them in order. Once you've done some of that homework, the next time you're out on a bike ride, sense your momentum and then shift up. See what it feels like and then shift up again. You don't have to rush the process. Maybe you just spend it in the first couple of gears, but let it begin to work in you. Just start giving place for a portion of God's words. That's part of that clearing out the weeds or turning over the soil. Give place. Prepare the earth. If nothing else, suspend your disbelief for a moment. Entertain the possibility that this might be true. Yield to the enticings of the Holy Spirit. Just make a little room for it. 28, now we will compare the word unto a seed. Now, if you give place, prepare the soil, that a seed may be planted in your heart. Behold, if it be a true seed or a good seed, and as long as you don't cast it out by your unbelief, you can ensure that none of this happens by altering the conditions of your experiment. So don't cast it out by your unbelief. That's part of that giving place for it. Don't resist the Spirit of the Lord. Again, that's ruining the experiment. That's not allowing it to grow. I used to see that typically on the back row of a seminary class where you could really sense the Spirit enter a room to confirm truth and there'd be some on that back row that would just kind of start to squirm, uncomfortable, resisting the Spirit of the Lord. As long as you don't force that false conclusion by establishing false premises to begin with, then what will happen? Four things he mentions in verse 28 that coincidentally provide us with a beautiful mnemonic device to help us remember what the seed will do. It spells seed. It will swell, it will enlarge, it will enlighten, and it will be delicious. There's the S-E-E-D. The word will swell within our breasts. Remember what Alma said back in chapter 5? Your souls will expand and with that increased lung capacity, you'll feel motivated to sing the song of redeeming love. Well, this will swell within your breast. When you feel these swelling motions, you will begin to say within yourselves, it must needs be that this is a good seed or that the word is good for it beginneth to enlarge my soul. It beginneth to enlighten my understanding. You see the two body parts we've been seeing already, the mind and the heart. The enlarged soul is the heart. The enlightened understanding is the mind. He'll say it even more clearly at the end of verse 34. Your understanding doth begin to be enlightened and your mind doth begin to expand. Either way, it's this expansion. It's this growth. I love that about the truths of the gospel. They grow within me. It makes more sense. It's like my spirit straightens up to its full stature. My mind grabs a hold of some doctrine and it just keeps growing and things make more and more sense to me. This is how faith grows. And throughout the process, it is delicious 
to me. That's the fruit of the tree of life, right? Sweet above all that is sweet, the most delicious above any other fruit, just the joy that it brings. How could I keep from singing? Verse 29, would not this increase your faith? Of course it would. Things you've never felt, thoughts you've never had, changed tastes and desires, purified appetites, a depth of understanding, a depth of thought, a depth of character. All of that is this expanded soul that the gospel brings. This is what increases our faith. But then he adds this at the end of 29. But it still hasn't grown to a perfect knowledge. We're still on the faith stage. You know something about the seed, but do you yet know all there is to know about the plant that is beginning to grow? Verse 30, Behold, as the seed swelleth and sprouteth and beginneth to grow, then you must needs say that the seed is good. For behold, it swelleth and sprouteth and beginneth to grow. Those are your observations. This was your hypothesis. The prediction is now coming to pass. It's confirming your initial conjecture. Will not this strengthen your faith? Yea, it will strengthen your faith. For ye will say, I know that this is a good seed. For behold, it sprouteth and beginneth to grow. And now, behold, are ye sure that this is a good seed? I say unto you, yea, for every seed bringeth forth unto its own likeness. I love that. If the seed is the word, that's what he said back in 28. The primary song was close, but got it just a bit off. The primary song says, faith is like a little seed. No, the word is like a little seed. Faith is what allows it to grow. Or conversely, faith is what grows as it does. Faith growing into perfect knowledge. But if the seed is the word, and if we learn from John 1 that the word is Christ, then planting Christ in us, that's what Alma is trying to do for these antichrist Zoramites. It's the great question that Amulek will bring up again in 34. If the seed is Christ and it begins to grow within us and every seed bringeth forth unto its own likeness, that's one of the best evidences of the goodness and the truth of the seed. What likeness does it bring forth in me? Have you received his image in your countenance, Alma said in chapter 5? Have you experienced this mighty change in your hearts? Have you been spiritually begotten of God? What likeness is it bringing forth in you? To me, honestly, one of the greatest evidences of experimenting upon the words of Christ is the way that it makes you more like him. When I see a true Christian, I think, wow, that is a well-run experiment. That is a seed that has brought forth its own likeness. Jesus planted within us and then growing within us. No wonder our souls need to expand. No wonder our minds need to be enlightened. Because the soul of Christ, the mind of Christ, is so far beyond our own. We need to grow into it. We need to grow up in God. But I so often see this in senior missionaries, for example. I've served with many over the years, and they're some of the most celestial seedlings that I've ever seen. A lifetime of that seed bringing forth its own likeness, and that person is like Jesus. When you see someone who reminds you of the Savior, it's because the seed that they planted was good and true and it swelled within them, and it enlarged and enlightened them. It became delicious, and they kept on eating. Such beautiful, convincing evidence. 32, if the seed grows, you know it's good. 33, because you tried the experiment and planted the seed, and it swells and sprouts and grows, you must needs know that the seed is good. And now behold, is your knowledge perfect? Now back in 29, he said no. Yes, it would increase your faith, but no, it's still not perfect knowledge. But it still grows. It's still swelling, sprouting, beginning to grow. So what's he saying in 34? Is your knowledge perfect? Yay! So he's changed it. Yes, your knowledge is perfect. But notice this three-word phrase. Yea, your knowledge is perfect in that thing. So in that thing. 
I've sometimes heard ex-Mormons or anti-Mormons say, oh, there's that domino analogy that you get from the introduction of the Book of Mormon, that once you know the Book of Mormon is true, then you know that Joseph Smith is a true prophet, and you know that the church is restored, and on and on. And, but just that one thing, and boom, all the dominoes fall. Some want to push back against that and say, well, it was a, a rather flimsy faith, but then you have all these other things hanging on that one good feeling you once had. I can see where they're coming from. That's why, in my opinion, it's important to get other witnesses of other things along the path. Don't, you don't have to only have to have one anchor point as you're climbing the mountain. And I love how specific Alma is here, that your knowledge is perfect in that thing. You'll still need faith for other things as those things grow from faith to perfect knowledge. But at least you do have that one anchor, that bolt in the mountain that you can clip into and feel safe. In that thing, now your faith is dormant. And this because you know. So he's still grappling with this difference between faith and perfect knowledge. And once faith becomes perfect knowledge, then it ceases to be faith. It's dormant. If I'm free climbing, rock climbing, I need faith and focus and overcoming fear to free climb. But once I get to an anchor and clip in, then I can rest assured on that one. Now, I still want to move forward. I still have much of the cliff face yet to ascend. And for that, I'll still need faith and focus and no fear until I get to the next anchor point and clip in. That's part of this growing in faith. The third part of the ninth article of faith is me free climbing up into new directions, finding anchor points or crevices in the rock where I can sink a bolt. That's the second part of the ninth article of faith. Things God is now revealing to me. This is becoming strong. Faith is becoming dormant in this. It's becoming perfect knowledge. And the first part of the ninth article of faith, all that God has revealed, are all those anchor points below me in elevation, with my rope threaded through every one of them as I continue climbing towards the top. Verse 35, Oh then, is not this real? I love that that's the word he chose. He didn't just say, is not this true? He says, is not this real? Yes, it's true too, but sometimes we want to limit truth to some kind of objective fact, some kind of empirically proven, measurable, scientific kind of a thing. But life, with all the humanities that are in it, is not just true, it's real. It's messy at times, it's ambiguous, it's not clear cut. There's subjectivity there. There's experience. There's relationships. That's why this whole side of things, this whole area of human existence, has to be more than merely true. It has to be real. Roll up our sleeves and get dirt under the fingernails and just grapple with things and figure stuff out and rise and fall and rise again. I'm sorry if it doesn't seem as controlled an environment as the experiments in the pure scientific realm. But that's not where life is lived. I remember taking uh, AP Physics in high school and learning all these rules and equations and things to figure out stuff. Always with the caveat, this is all how it works in a vacuum. With wind resistance and elevation changes and everything else, the final result may be a tiny bit off from what you actually see in this cold, clear, controlled, experiment or equation. That's not life. So to actually do it where it's real, instead of where it's simply contrived and antiseptic, now it's going to be messy. Now the equations are going to be a lot harder. We're no longer just doing it on paper. We're doing it in real life. So I'm saying nothing to minimize the truth of the gospel or the truth inherent in this experiment, but I even prefer the word that Alma uses. It's more than true. It's real. It's light. It's good. It's discernible. You can see the difference. You can feel the difference. You might not be able to measure it in some kind of scale or spectrometer, but recognizing the light in someone's countenance, the goodness of their heart, those things can be spiritually discerned. That's what makes them discernible. But then he says this at the end of 35. Now behold, after you have tasted this light, is your knowledge perfect? Now we want to say, well, yeah, right? We, we said yes back in verse 34. Knowledge is perfect. But that was only knowledge in that thing. 
in the goodness of the seed? In 36, he answers his question, nay, your knowledge isn't perfect. So, don't lay aside your faith. You're still going to need that. You've only exercised your faith to plant the seed that ye might try the experiment to know if the seed was good. That was the thing in which their knowledge was perfect back in 34, right? Your knowledge is perfect in that thing. What thing? The seed. The word is good. But do I know everything about that word? Or better yet, what the results of living that word for my entire life will be? That's the difference Alma is getting at. You might have perfect knowledge in the seed, but still exercise faith because there's a tree a coming. There's yet great growth to be had. That's what we're after. Don't stop with the good seed. Don't stop in testimony meeting and say, I know the church is true. Say, I know the church is true and I have faith in what it is helping me become. It's one thing to say, I know the gospel has been restored. Another thing to say, and I have faith that the gospel is restoring me to the kind of disciple of Jesus Christ I've always been intending to become or the kind of child of God that he's always expected of me. That's where I have faith still. Even God grapples with this. God has perfect knowledge, right? He is omniscient, but he has faith in us because we're still in that process of becoming. We're the unproven part, but he has faith in us. And our unprovenness, our potential for yet continued growth is what allows space for even God's faith to flourish taking nothing away from his perfect knowledge. It adds an element of faith. Same for us. So in 37, now let's talk about the tree. We have perfect knowledge of the seed. Let's talk about faith in the tree. Behold, as the tree beginneth to grow, ye will say, let us nourish it with great care. By the way, there seems to be a subtle shift in pronouns. Back at the end of 28, it was, it's delicious to me. It enlarges my soul. It enlightens my understanding. This is first person singular. I'm experimenting upon the word. I don't even know if it's true, but I want, I'm hoping. I desire to know and desire to believe. I'm exercising this particle of faith. But now that I know that the word is true, that Jesus is the Christ, then I'm never alone in my experiments again. I'm with him. So he and I nourish the tree together. How can it not be together? He's the seed. He's the tree. It's his love that is the fruit that grows on it. So let us nourish it with great care. We know it's worthy of it because we know that it's good and it's true and it's real. Let it get root. Let it grow up. Let it bring forth fruit unto us. If we nourish it with much care, it will do all of those things. You see how we've crossed the spectrum of the soils from the parable of the sower? Far from the wayside, their afflictions have pulled out the rocks, overturned the soil and the rocky ground. They've plucked out the thorns. Their poverty has kept them from concerns with the deceitfulness of riches or the cares of the world. But even in this good ground, where the seed has grown, that says everything that we needed to know about the seed. But now let's let it grow. Even in the parable, it talks about the seed bringing forth fruit. Some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. That tends to be the case with good trees. They become more and more productive as time goes on. If they're nourished with great care. If their roots continue to sink deep. On the other hand, verse 38, if we neglect the tree, if we take no thought for its nourishment, it won't get any root. And it's not the seed's fault. We knew it was good. It started growing. When the heat of the sun cometh and scorcheth it, because it hath no root, it withers away and ye pluck it up and cast it out. That's back to the stony ground. That's the sun coming. That's scorching it because it doesn't have any root. In fact, in one of the accounts of the parable of the sower, It says that it has no root in itself. It's been leeching off someone else's taproot. Again, maybe it's good that you were transplanted from the synagogue. So you'd have to learn to grow on your own. 
Maybe it's good that we can't go to sacrament meeting. We can't go to church. I can't depend on other people's roots to bring me my living water. Time for some self-nourishment here. Again, 39, it's not the seed's fault. It's not because the seed wasn't good. We've had evidence of that. We have perfect knowledge of that. That's the irony of so many people who leave the church. They had a perfect knowledge of the seed's goodness, but they stopped nourishing it. No wonder that seed didn't bring forth its own likeness. They never became as Christ-like as the Lord intended them to become. It's not because the fruit isn't desirable. It's more desirable than anything, Lehi tells us. It's because your ground is barren. You will not nourish the tree. You cannot have the fruit. It's gardening in reverse. The Lord doesn't give up on any part of his vineyard. If he finds wayside or stony ground, he starts digging and dunging, right? If he finds a weed patch, then he starts to weed. And even on good ground, he's constantly nourishing and pruning and grafting and doing all those other things. Constantly coaxing the soil to his side of the spectrum. Meanwhile, the adversary is doing the opposite. He doesn't give up on any part of the vineyard either. Even those on good ground with significant growth, he wants to limit that growth, minimize nourishment, thwart the growth of roots. Then he'll start planting weeds. That's the wheat and the tares, right? An enemy has done this. Let's start sapping the strength of the soil. It's, it's already proven that it's good. And we knew the seed was but let's divert that strength into other things. Once that starts happening and the growth really is inhibited, then let's start packing down the soil, compacted earth, introduce rocks of our own. Even if it ends up killing the weeds, we don't care. Our purpose was never introducing weeds for weeds sake. It was to eliminate growth of good plants. And with compacted earth before long, we can end up making this look like wayside which was always our biggest hope to begin with. You see the tug of war between these two gardeners? Verse 40, If ye will not nourish the word, looking forward with an eye of faith to the fruit thereof. My knowledge is in the seed. My faith is in the fruit. That's the ultimate goal. What will the results of a lifetime of discipleship be? If we don't have that eye of faith, then we'll never pluck of the fruit of the tree. And here, really for the first time, we see just what kind of plant we've been growing. Usually, somebody just puts a seed in your hand, you probably have no idea what exactly this is going to become. Remember, John says that in 1 John 3, verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. See what John's getting at with that? I know I'm a son of God now. I know I'm God's daughter. But I've got no idea what I'm going to grow up to become. Eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man that which God hath prepared for them that love him. You've got no idea what kind of plant this is intended to be. Well, here now that we know, it's the tree of life. Can you picture Lehi waking up from his dream? Excited for this realization? Wait, wait, wait. That's where this tree comes from? It's the word of God planted in good soil, nourished and nurtured by a loving father until it becomes the love of God manifest to all of his children. We've been growing trees of life this whole time. 41, if we will nourish the word, yea, nourish the tree as it beginneth to grow. How? By your faith with great diligence, with patience. It's going to take belief. It's going to take work. It's going to take time. Looking forward to the fruit thereof, it shall take root. And behold, it shall be a tree springing up unto everlasting life. Does that phrase ring any bells? Remember Jesus speaking to the Samaritan woman at the well, talking about a well of water springing up unto everlasting life? The irony of this is that neither trees nor wells move. They're permanent. Trees don't get up and walk. Tolkien's Ents notwithstanding. Wells are there where you dug them. But the beauty of the well that Jesus talks about or the 
tree that we see here, those are portable because they're within us. I can have living water. I can have delicious fruit. I can have shade and shelter from the world's beating sun wherever I go because they're inside me now. In fact, they are me now. The seed has brought forth its own likeness. He sums it up in 42. Because of your diligence and your faith and your patience, those same attributes he mentioned earlier, with the word in nourishing it, that it may take root in you. There's that permanence, that portability. Behold, by and by, be patient, it'll come. Ye shall pluck the fruit thereof. And then echoing Lehi, which is most precious, which is sweet above all that is sweet, which is white above all that is white, yea, and pure above all that is pure. Ye shall feast upon this fruit, even until ye are filled, that ye hunger not, neither shall ye thirst. All you poor Zoramites, in your coarse apparel, living hand to mouth, trying to feed your families, you'll never hunger or thirst again. You will feast and feast forever. Then, my brethren, then ye shall reap the rewards of your faith and your diligence and patience. It's the third time he's repeated those three. You need them all. Faith without works is dead. There's faith and diligence. And let patience have her perfect work. It will take time. But if you'll offer those, the line will keep moving up. You'll keep ascending the mountain and through long suffering and plenty of waiting, the tree will bring forth fruit unto you. And that fruit is the love of God. I testify of this tree. I know and this is not just Mormon slang. I know the goodness and the truthfulness and the reality of the seed of God's word. That's why I spend my lifetime in it. I am seeing evidences of the tree. As my soul expands, as my mind enlarges, as I become slowly a little more like Jesus, and that's where I keep my eye of faith. He is the perfect seed. He is the tree of life. He is the good gardener. And as we come unto him and nourish our faith in him, that faith will eventually become a perfect knowledge. For this is life eternal, that we might know God and his son. So try the experiment and reap the reward. There is no lab work in life that can compare to this one. In the first part of this lesson, we studied Alma chapter 32, this incredible experiment upon the word. We talked about the difference between faith and perfect knowledge, and that once the one grows into the other, then faith becomes dormant, and that there needs to be time. That's why patience was brought up so many times. Time for faith to perform its work in changing us. That's the exercise of things. And to become something, to really get in shape, exercise can't be a one-time thing. That's why signs don't work, ask Korahor. That's why trees can't just be transplanted. Seeds have to grow. I grew up in L.A. I don't think anybody grew anything except probably illegal drugs. But I remember in the first house that we owned, I had a little spot on the side yard where we created some above ground gardens, those square box gardens that are called. And we planted all kinds of different things, mostly vegetables. I have this vivid memory of getting a little packet of seeds. I think it was broccoli. And I remember dumping them into my hand and looking at them with complete skepticism, I'll admit. I looked at them going, <laughs> yeah, right. See, I don't have a green thumb. I've never grown anything. I mean. I barely know how to even cook anything or bake anything. To me, cakes come out of boxes, and that's cooking. When I see somebody actually pulling out flour, it's like, whoa. This is cooking on an elemental level. 
So for me, where do vegetables come from? They come from the store. They don't come from the ground. I had no faith in farming, okay? No experience in it. And so looking at this handful of tiny little seeds thinking, there's no way this is actually going to become something. But I figured I'd done all this work to make the garden. Might as well put them in. So I did. And I ended up loving that little garden. I'd come home from work and just be out there watering or just seeing what had sprouted or grown up at all since the last time. Honestly, as the vegetables started to grow, I thought, I can teach Alma 32 with faith from now on. Seeds really do grow. Totally new experience for me. But it was a leap of faith to start. And it's the faith, even more than the final food, that God is trying to grow. It's the growth, not the greenery, that he's after. That's why he refuses to give those obvious signs. That's why Jesus didn't leap from the Temple Mount to prove his divinity. That's why God is so good at self-restraint, to keep himself from proving every atheist wrong, because it short-circuits the process. It hands out the fruit of the Tree of Life far too soon after having eaten the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And you live forever in your sins. In this case, you live forever in your perfect knowledge, but having never developed faith along the way. Rudolf Otto, the idea of the holy, that great book that I quoted at the end of Alma chapter 31, he said this, and I love the point he's making. If there is a God, he said, and he believed that there was. But in trying to resurrect the idea of the holy, he did know the skeptical audience that he was trying to convince. If there is a God, and if he chose to reveal himself, he could do it no otherwise than thus. I love what he's saying there. If God's goal is faith, then there needs to be just enough evidence in this experiment to confirm our faith, but not so much evidence from the start to obviate our faith. In other words, we do have a leg to stand on, but not laurels to rest on. This is an exercise after all. There will be measurable results, but they'll have to be spiritually discerned. There will be enlargement and enlightenment, but it will be of your soul and your mind it will be discernible, but only through the spiritual senses. If there's a God and he wants to reveal himself, if there's a God that wants us to develop faith, then he has to allow that if to exist. He has to carve out space with the third part of the ninth article of faith, things I have not yet revealed. There has to be room for uncertainties so that faith has a place to go and to grow. That's why life isn't just true, it's why life is real. With real question marks and real concerns and real ambiguities and real messiness. And again, that's not just in the restored gospel. That's not just church history. It's not even just in religion. It's in life. It's in the humanities because we're human. And with God being who God is and him knowing that we are what we are, he could not do it otherwise than thus. Not enough evidence, and the experiment could never be proven. Too much evidence, and the experiment could never be disproven. In fact, there would never be an experiment. It would just be factual knowledge from the first. There have to be enough exclamation points to confirm what we're learning, but enough question marks to keep our learning alive. God walks that balance beam beautifully. Again, just enough evidence to make faith plausible, but not so much evidence to make faith unnecessary. Amazing how he does this. Now, by the time Alma chapter 33 begins, he sense that Alma is done, but the people aren't. He's given this incredible discourse, but for his audience, they're still a little confused about, okay, that's starting to make sense, but... Can we get down to details? How do I actually start this thing? In verse 1, they send forth unto him desiring to know whether they should believe in one God that they might obtain this fruit of which he had spoken. 
or how they should plant the seed, or the word of which he had spoken, which he said must be planted in their hearts, or in what manner they should begin to exercise their faith. You see, they've got all these questions in their mind. They're just kind of throwing a bunch out at him, all of which seem to boil down to, well, how do we start? How do I begin to exercise my faith? Now, Alma's going to answer their question and answer a few unspoken questions along the way. Verse 2, he says to them, Behold, ye have said that ye could not worship your God because ye are cast out of your synagogues. That's how chapter 32 began. He comes back to that. But I need you to know that worship, which is a big part of this planting that I've been talking about, is not confined to a single place. Remember, it's not confined to a single person either. Men, women, and children can all conduct this experiment. Well, here location doesn't matter either. This is like Jesus' conversation with the woman at the well. And her kind of getting in Christ's face almost saying, we Samaritans say that this is the place to worship. You Jews say that Jerusalem is the place to worship. Well, which one is it? And Jesus basically says, the day is coming that neither one of those places will matter. It's not about address. It's about attitude. Forget location. Lifestyle is what the Father is after. So he's looking for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. It's how we worship more than where. So let me clarify the where really quick so that you stop dwelling on that. He starts quoting a bunch of Old Testament scripture, which we no longer have in our Old Testament, Zenus and Zenic, for example. But here quoting Zenus, he mentions in verse 4, you can pray in the wilderness. In 5, you can pray in the field. In 6, you can pray in the house. In 7, you can pray in the closet. In 9, you can pray in the congregation. And in 10, you can pray even if you've been cast out from that congregation. Sound familiar? Any of these relate to you, Zoramites, that have been cast out of your synagogues? Anywhere you go, you can worship. So don't feel like this experiment is closed off to you. Please don't think that heaven or heavenly father are out of reach. He has not locked you out. But again, it's not where, it's how. So to your question of how do we plant the seed? How do we exercise faith? How do we get this word into our hearts? That's the question. How do I get the word in me? so that then I can begin nourishing it so that it will swell and expand and enlighten and become delicious. His answers, we might shrug and say, oh, those are just the primary ones. And unfortunately, when we say primary answers, kind of dismissively, we use primary as in, oh, little kids, aren't there more advanced things to do in the gospel? Well, primary also means fundamental, foundational, as in the primary colors. Red, yellow, blue aren't called that because they're childish. It's because they're foundational. And every other color on the wheel grow out of those primary colors. So what are the primary, foundational, fundamental keystone answers to how do we get the word planted in our hearts? First place he goes is scripture. That's why he's quoting Zenos and Zenic and Moses. In verse 2, he says, you ought to search the scriptures. If you thought you could only worship in a synagogue, if you thought the scriptures taught you that, you don't get it. You don't understand them. So search the scriptures. That's going to be one important element of planting the seed in your heart. And three, he mentions it. Do you remember to have read what Zenos the prophet of old has said? In verse 12, he asks, do you believe those scriptures which have been written by them of old? And in 14, he says, I would ask if ye have read the scriptures, if ye have, how can ye disbelieve on the Son of God? I've said it a bunch of times in these videos. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's how the beginnings are supposed to be, with the Word. You want to plant the seed? Start with God's Word. Again, maybe that's a higher gear on your bike. And starting with that on an upward climb is too much to ask. Well, maybe you need to build up some momentum before you get here. Hopefully that's what these videos or other resources can do to make scripture more understandable, more applicable, more relevant. But sooner or later, the scriptures have to be part of this experiment. There's no way around it, nor would we want there to be. But scripture is only one part of it, one primary answer. The other is prayer, but real prayer. 
That's part of nourishing the word. That's part of planting the seed. It's communicating with my Father in heaven. It's coming to know him in ways that are far more personal and far more real, far more discernible than the philosophical arguments for the existence of God. Again, those are merely mental acquiescences rather than experiential interactions. And so verse 3, what he finds in the scriptures is the call to prayer. But notice what he says about it. We tend to say our prayers, which is kind of a cop-out for real prayer. The phrase say prayers, that's not scriptural. Ask Enos about his. Things like soul hungering, raising voice high that it reached the heavens, crying unto God. That's the verb that Zenus uses so often. So from verse 4 through verse 11, what kind of prayer is it? Well, in 3, Alma says, concerning prayer or worship. So that's the first element of prayer. It needs to be worshipful. So often we simply say, oh, here's the four steps. Address Heavenly Father, thank Him for stuff, ask for stuff, and close in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Ah, easy. The Lord's Prayer had a few extra elements. For example, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Do we hallow God? Do we honor him? Do we worship him in our prayers? Remember, it's not location, woman at the well. It's worshiping the Father in spirit and in truth. Are our prayers worshipful? Next in four, thou art merciful, O God, for thou hast heard my prayer even when I was in the wilderness. Yea, thou wast merciful when I prayed concerning those who were mine enemies, and thou didst turn them to me. Are our prayers selfless? Are we praying for others, even for our enemies, those who despitefully use us and persecute us? In verse 5, Yea, O God, thou wast merciful unto me when I did cry unto thee in my field, when I did cry unto thee in my prayer, and thou didst hear me. And again, O God, when I did turn to my house, thou didst hear me in my prayer. And when I did turn unto my closet, O Lord, and prayed unto thee, thou didst hear me. So from the field, to turning to the house, to turning into the closet, this seems to be a constant prayer. Again, not site-specific, but not even time-specific. Well, at each meal, and before I go to bed, and when I wake up in the morning, no, just from field to house, to closet. Wherever you go, have your hearts drawn out to God. Again, prayer is meant to be relational even more than merely conversational. It's a connection we keep with heaven. It's always remembering him like we promise each week. In verse 8, Thou art merciful unto thy children when they cry unto thee to be heard of thee and not of men, and thou wilt hear them. So different compared to the Ramayamtam, right? Where it was all about being heard and seen of men. So are our prayers humble? Are they focused on God? Is he the one we're talking to? Or are we talking to the crowd? I think sometimes people slip, and hopefully it's just an accident. But sometimes in prayer, they talk about God as if they didn't realize they're speaking to God. Because they focused on him in these prayers. In verse 9, Yea, O God, thou hast been merciful unto me and heard my cries in the midst of thy congregations. Again, beyond location, it's my cries, even in the midst of this large congregation. Are our prayers specific? Are they individual? Or is it just part of the Mass? Can we differentiate a personal prayer from a congregational one? Is my communication with Heavenly Father as individual as I am. In verse 10, Yea, thou hast also heard me when I have been cast out and have been despised by mine enemies. Yea, thou didst hear my cries and wast angry with mine enemies, and thou didst visit them in thine anger with speedy destruction. This is the second time that he's prayed for enemies. The first time the Lord was able to turn those enemies toward the person praying. This time that didn't happen. But the person left them in the hands of the Lord, left them to God's justice and judgment, not taking it upon themselves. In other words, this is a trusting and resigned prayer, leaving things in the Lord's hands. And finally, in verse 11, that is, hear me because of mine afflictions, that humbles us, and my sincerity, another key factor in our prayer. 
and it is because of thy Son that thou hast been thus merciful unto me. Therefore I will cry unto thee in all mine afflictions. There's again that constancy. For in thee is my joy. Do we feel that in our prayers? There's the humility, the hallowed be thy name, but also the joy, the, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Rejoicing in God, glorying in him, as both Alma and Ammon are such great examples of. For thou hast turned thy judgments away from me because of thy son. Now, did you catch two elements in that passage from Zenos that kept coming up? One was mercy. Over and over and over in those verses, thou wast merciful when I cried unto you here. Thou wast merciful when I prayed there. Thou art merciful unto thy children. Thou art merciful, O God. I hope that when we pray, we keep in mind God's mercy through it all. It's what gives us faith that answers will come, that help will be forthcoming. And the other phrase that kept coming up, in verse 11 at least, because of thy son. That's how we connect to God in the first place. Christ is our intermediary with him. And so that last phrase in the prayer just might be the most important part. I cringe sometimes to hear people rush through the last line of a prayer as if they were diving for the finish line. I'm almost there. And so in the name of Jesus Christ becomes a one syllable word rush through to get to the amen and I'm done, off the hook. Oh, if there's any time to slow down and savor the words, it's that ending. That's what allows us to communicate with a father that the fall has cut us off from. God can be merciful. All that talk of mercy, he can be merciful because of the son. He can turn away his judgments. We don't deserve any of the things we're asking for. We're unprofitable servants, right? No matter how hard we try to work, we can enslave ourselves, but we'll never pay back the king for our many murders. It's because of the son that he can turn away his judgments. It's because of the son that he can be merciful. He reiterates it in verse 13. Thou hast turned away thy judgments because of thy son. That's Alma's focal point. It's not just, you ought to search the scriptures and you ought to pray. No, it's, you ought to search the scriptures because, verse 14, how can you disbelieve on the Son of God if you've read them? You ought to pray, not just to pray, but prayer is what allows us to come to know the Father and the Son as we pray to the one in the name of the other. Prayer and scripture study are not the ends, but they're the means to the greatest end, which is coming to know God and his only begotten son. That's how you plant the seed. The word is Christ. Plant him in your hearts through sincere, constant, selfless, specific prayer and through diligent, serious scripture study. Focus on Jesus in both instances. Verse 15, Zenos wasn't the only one to teach this. Zenos did too. 16, this is one of the things that he said. Thou art angry, O Lord. Uh-oh, what about all this talk about mercy? Mercy, mercy, because of the Son. Well, 16, interesting twist. Thou art angry, O Lord, with this people, because they will not understand thy mercies, which thou hast bestowed upon them because of thy Son. So Zenos is echoing Zenos with the same focal points, a merciful God because of God's Son. And yet the way he puts it is so ironic. What's the one thing that makes God angry? Assuming that he's angry. <laughs> you catch that twist? You're angry because we don't understand that you're merciful. Maybe he's suggesting we get the God that we assume him to be. You refuse to look at the Son and see the Father's character through the lens of his only begotten. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but should receive everlasting life. For the Father sent not the Son to condemn the world, but to save it. Because of thy Son, we can know of a merciful Father. We don't have to fear an angry one. He's only angry 
if you eliminate his mercy. Because God is both perfectly just and perfectly merciful, he proves those contraries perfectly. Then remove the mercy that comes because of the Son, and what do you have left? Just his justice, a justice which we deserve, a justice that we would fear to the point, as Alma said earlier, of calling down the mountains to fall upon us, to hide us from his face. But when we come to know the Son, we are coaxed out from underneath the mountain. We'll see this in Alma 36 soon. And we will know God for who he is a merciful and loving and self-sacrificing Father because of the Son. So 17, two prophets so far have testified of the Son of God. In Zenic's case, because the people would not understand his words, they stoned him to death. He stood behind his witness of Jesus with his own life. But that's not all, verse 18. They're not the only ones that have spoken concerning the Son of God. Verse 19, let's add Moses to the list. If by two or three witnesses shall every word be established, let's go with three today. Zenus, Zenic, Moses. Behold, a type was raised up in the wilderness that whosoever would look upon it might live. And many did look and live. This is the story of Moses and the brazen serpent. Look to this. Have faith that God can heal you because he will lift his son upon a cross. To draw all men to him, as Jesus will say later in 3 Nephi. Verse 20, the bad news. But few understood the meaning of those things, and this because of the hardness of their hearts. Remember we saw that back in Alma 12? A hard heart means you receive the lesser portion of the word until you know nothing concerning his mysteries, including the mystery of how can something so simple look and live? Really? Be healed from the bites of these fiery, flying, poisonous serpents because I looked at a brazen serpent on a staff, those hardened hearts kept them from understanding. It kept others from even trying. Some at least had a desire to believe, and so they began their experiment. Others didn't even have a particle of faith and therefore would not exercise anything, even so much as a neck muscle to turn or an eye muscle to look. As a result, they perished. There were many who were so hardened that they would not look. Therefore, they perished. Talk about stubbornness. You can't even chalk it up to laziness because the thought of exercising is so daunting. It's just look and live. This is an adamant stubbornness of heart he talked about back in chapter 32, right? Being compelled to believe, being compelled to know. Well, they'd have to be compelled to look and they refused to do it something about that obstinance. I remember teaching a student once whose father taught religion and she didn't want to have anything to do with it. And there was a stubbornness. I remember once just laughing to myself, wondering if her dad was a plumber, would she refuse to flush? Is, it, is, it, is she anti-God or is she just anti-dad? And this is dad's life and I don't want to be dad and so forget the whole thing. This, this stubbornness of heart, which is a lack of faith. That's what he says at the end of 20. The reason they would not look is because they did not believe that it would heal them. That's the particle of faith. That's the giving place for a portion of God's word. Just experiment. Try. Verse 21, Oh, my brethren, if you could be healed by merely casting about your eyes that you might be healed, would you not behold quickly? Or would you rather harden your hearts in unbelief and be slothful? There's that word we hinted at Back in chapter 32, he that is compelled in all things, the same as a slothful and not a wise servant. What a word, slothful. Just hanging upside down from trees. It takes too much exercise to actually stand on top of the branch. Don't even want to exercise your hands to hold on to the branch. Oh, just a nice curved claw will do. I can just hang here. I can grow moss on my fur because I'm not going to move. Wow, what an animal to be called. Verse 22, if so, woe shall come upon you. If not, then cast about your eyes. Don't look up to the top of a ramiumptum where you're not invited. Look up to God who is inviting all of you to come unto him. Begin to believe in the Son of God. And what's specifically about him? 
what elements of the word need to be planted, that he will come to redeem his people, that he shall suffer and die to atone for their sins, that he shall rise again from the dead, which shall bring to pass the resurrection, that all men shall stand before him to be judged at the last and judgment day according to their works. So believe in Jesus, in his ministry and mission, his atonement and crucifixion, his resurrection, his judgment. That's the word you need to plant in your hearts. Verse 23. And as it beginneth to swell, nourish it. Nourish it by your faith. You'll end up with perfect knowledge of the goodness and reality of the seed. Keep nourishing it by your faith and it will become a tree springing up in you unto everlasting life. See how he's ending 33 the same way he ended 32? This portable, internal tree of life. With that inside you then, may God grant unto you that your burdens may be light. You have low-hanging branches to hang them all upon. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. These are the Zoramite poor, the ones that constructed the synagogues themselves, the burdened, heavy laden. Come rest in the shade. Lay your burdens at the roots or hang them on the branches, and they will be light through the joy of his Son. He'll forget all about them as you are partaking of fruit that is sweeter and whiter and purer and more delicious than anything you've ever eaten. Even all this can ye do, if ye will. Amen. You just have to want to. It really is that simple. It's not easy. It does take exercise. It's awake and arouse your faculties. It's planting and digging and dunging and nourishing. But it really is that simple. A testimony is yours for the asking. But do you really want one? Then look, live, experiment, have an eye of faith, looking forward to the fruit of the life that you are living. Now, as we saw earlier in Alma, this beautiful tag team companionship between Alma and Amulek, we see that as we move into chapter 34. As Alma has taught 32 and 33, and now Amulek gives second witness. Verse 1, Alma sits down, and Amulek stands and begins to teach. And he says in verse 2, My brethren, I think it is impossible that ye should be ignorant of the things which have been spoken concerning the coming of Christ, who is taught by us to be the Son of God. Yea, I know that these things were taught unto you bountifully before your dissension from among us. Remember, these are the Zoramites. They were dissenters from the Nephites. They neglected the practices and performances of the church in activity, right? This is a mission of reactivation, not of conversion. The anti-Nephi Lehi's had to be taught things they did not know about the great spirit and the promised son of God. But for these Zoramites, that's impossible that you don't know these things. I know you know them. And I can say that. I'm Amulek. I knew but would not know. I was taught bountifully to, even in Ammonihah. But you Zoramites, you know. I hope, by the way, that those who have grown up in an LDS home or those who have grown up as members of the church, I hope that we can say it's impossible that you wouldn't know about Jesus, that you wouldn't understand the mercy of Heavenly Father. I meet so many people in the church that grew up in the church, but who are still ignorant of the goodness of God because they've only heard God's justice or anger sounding in their ears. Ignorant of the grace of Christ, even though it is taught bountifully to us. Read the Book of Mormon. How can you disbelieve in the merciful Son of God? Pray. How can you not know of God's love for you? Listen to prophets and apostles. And for anyone who teaches or serves or leads or speaks, in every sacrament meeting talk, in every class lesson, in every family scripture study, I hope we are making it impossible for our children, for our youth, for the people that we're serving. I hope we're making it impossible for them to be ignorant of the goodness of God. By the way we speak of him, by the way we teach of him, by the way we serve in his name, 
if everything we do is in the name of the Son and because of the Son, I hope we are teaching bountifully of his goodness so that it is impossible for people to be ignorant of that. The next time one of my evangelical pastor friends brings a group of evangelical students to come to Utah to meet the Latter-day Saints, I hope that after their experience here, that it would be impossible for them to be ignorant of our testimonies of Jesus Christ. I hope they go home thinking, I'd always been told that Mormons aren't Christians, but that's impossible based on what I've seen. They believe in him. They talk of him and rejoice in him and speak of him and prophesy of him and write according to their prophecies that their children may know, impossible to be ignorant, that we might know the source that we must look to for remission of our sins. May that be taught bountifully and powerfully and deeply enough that even after someone dissents from among us, they'll know that they were leaving Christians behind. Not hypocrites, not judgmental, holier-than-thou pseudo-saints, but real Christians. I think dissension would happen a lot less frequently if that's what they knew they were leaving. Verse 3 and 4, he repeats what his companion had just said. You have desired of my beloved brother, they loved each other, these companions did, that he should make known unto you what you should do because of your afflictions. He hath spoken somewhat unto you to prepare your minds, each companion building off the last. Yea, he hath exhorted you unto faith and to patience. Yea, even that ye would have so much faith as even to plant the word in your hearts, that ye may try the experiment of its goodness. And then he drills down to the core of it all. Verse 5. We have beheld that the great question, which is in your minds, is whether the word be in the Son of God, or whether there shall be no Christ. That's what the whole experiment was about. It's about Jesus. Even more than the Book of Mormon or Joseph Smith, it's about Jesus. I think if we did less in our attempts to prove the Book of Mormon is true and more to use the Book of Mormon to prove that Jesus is the Christ, people will end up loving the Book of Mormon as a result. But because it was source, not because it was target, because it was means, not because it was end, the point of the experiment is to make Christians of us. Korihor denied that. The people on the Ramiumpton denied that. That was their biggest dissension, was dissenting away from Jesus. Now in 6, my brother has proved unto you in many instances that the word is in Christ unto salvation. What kind of proof did he offer? Scriptural proof, first of all. Verse 7, he called upon Zenus, who taught that the redemption comes through the Son of God. He called upon Zenic, who gave his life for that witness. He called upon Moses and the brazen serpent he made. These three witnesses to prove that these things are true. But let me now give you an added one, a living one. Verse 8, Behold, I will testify unto you of myself, so independent of all these others, that these things are true. This is exactly what Amulek had done back in Ammonihah. When Zeezrom and others were scoffing and saying, Alma, who the heck are you? You're only one person. Why do we have to listen to you? Well, here they had more than one. But in both instances, Amulek rises and says, Let me add yet one more. A personal, living witness that these things are true. Of myself, I'll testify these things are true. Behold, I say unto you, I do know, not just faith anymore for him, it's perfect knowledge, I do know that Christ shall come among the children of men to take upon him the transgressions of his people and that he shall atone for the sins of the world. How do I know? Because the Lord God hath spoken it. That's the source of my testimony. But let me add to my spiritual witness, a logical explanation as well. Verse 9, it is expedient. It has to be this way. This is the logic. It is expedient that an atonement should be made. For according to the great plan of the eternal God, there must be an atonement made, or else all mankind must unavoidably perish. There's no other way around it. As Paul taught, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yea, all are hardened. Yea, all are fallen. All are lost. And they must perish except it be through the atonement which it is expedient should be made. The reality of the fall necessitates the reality of the atonement. Even skeptics have sometimes joked 
that the one Christian doctrine that does have empirical evidence is the fall. Human depravity. Sad that our lives give evidence to that. Well, may our lives also give evidence of the reality of the atonement. If there's one, logic requires that there be another. If this is the problem, there better be a solution. That's what all religions are after. How do you solve the problem of sin and death? They all have their answers. I found none as compelling as that of Christianity. Verse 10, it is expedient that there should be a great and last sacrifice. Yea, not a sacrifice of man. Jesus was more than that. Neither of beast, neither of any manner of fowl. For it shall not be a human sacrifice. Jesus was not solely human either. But it must be an infinite and eternal sacrifice. And those are some of his names, as he describes in section 19 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Now, 11 and 12, he says something interesting. He says, now there is not any man that can sacrifice his own blood, which will atone for the sins of another. If a man murdereth, behold, will our law, which is just, take the life of his brother? I say unto you, nay, the law requireth the life of him who hath murdered. Now, when I was younger, I would read that and go, wait a minute. He, didn't he just kind of explain the atonement? It almost seems like he disproved it right there. Or it kind of made it illogical, at least. The law would never take the brother of a murderer and take his life instead you'd have to take the life of the murderer. And I remember thinking, but isn't that what Jesus did? He took the place of the murderer and was killed in his stead. Isn't that him switching spots with Barabbas and by association with all of us? Well, if he was merely a man, just human, then yeah, that wouldn't make sense. That's unjust. But there's something about Christ's divinity. The fact he was infinite and eternal that makes this so different from merely one man taking the place of another. This is eternity replacing temporality. This is the Son of God interceding for all of the merely mortal sons and daughters of God who have ever lived. You see, part of the injustice of one human stepping in for another human to pay for their sins is that that person has sins of their own to pay for. That automatically disqualifies them from being in a position to absolve the sins of another. Wouldn't that seem self-serving in a way? Well, let's just, let's just eliminate sin, including mine. You see, we're all part perpetrator and a part victim. And how can a part perpetrator pay for some other perpetrator when they were perpetrators too? You see, Jesus isn't just taking the sinner's place one for one. He's taking sin's place, sin itself, the whole tangled mess. If you've ever tried to untangle a ball of string or yarn or the Christmas lights every December, I hate trying to untangle those because I'll be working in a knot, just some kind of messy tangle, and I think I've got it. But as I've untangled this part, it's just made the tangle down the line even worse than it was before. It's like I'm moving tangles around but never quite untangling things because I'm working on this. This is me. I've got my own issues. I'm working on my kids or my spouse or my family or my ward, the things that I know. But I don't know all the connections to everything else. These webs of interrelationships, of past experience, of nature and nurture, all of that. I do not have perfect justice nor perfect mercy and certainly not perfect judgment to know how to balance those other two. And yet Christ has them all to perfection. He knows the whole strand and so he can untangle them all without further complicating something else down the line. He's the only one that sees the entire strand for what it is. It's not just a one-for-one -one replacement. He's not just suffering for your sins, though he is doing that. But he is taking on sin in its entirety. The whole tangled mess. That's why there can be nothing which is short of an infinite atonement which will suffice for the sins of the world. Someone willing to be pure victim, having never been a perpetrator, to suffer for all sin, having never committed one, answering the ends of the law because he fulfilled it, the whole thing, end to end and beyond. Verse 13, it is expedient that there should be a great and last sacrifice. Then shall there be 
or it is expedient there should be a stop to the shedding of blood. All that preparatory work has served its purpose. The previews are over. It's time for the main attraction. Then shall the law of Moses be fulfilled. It shall all be fulfilled. Every jot, every tittle, none shall have passed away. And then 14, which in my opinion is the lens through which we should read the entire Old Testament. This is the whole meaning of the law. Every wit, every strange sacrifice, every detailed description of what an offering is supposed to entail. All of it pointing to that great and last sacrifice. And that great and last sacrifice will be the Son of God, yea, infinite and eternal. Some of my most cherished memories and experiences in the Old Testament have come when I've read something about the law, some sacrificial rite or act that was confusing. But to look at it through the lens of Alma 3414 and force myself to unpack it until every wit began pointing me to the great and last sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Most of them I haven't figured out every wit yet. But I have come to see Jesus in places I never would have expected him in the law of Moses. And, by the way, I think we can and should do the same thing with every performance in the church today. Every ordinance, every element of the temple, every sacred symbol pointing to Jesus and his atonement. Verse 15, thus he shall bring salvation to all those who shall believe on his name. That's why developing faith and planting this seed is so essential for us all. This being the intent of this last sacrifice, to bring about the bowels of mercy, which overpowereth justice and bringeth about means unto men that they may have faith unto repentance. I love those phrases. In two weeks, when we see Alma teaching his son Corianton, he will talk about justice and mercy and even personify them with gendered pronouns. You can probably guess which is which. Justice is gendered male and mercy is gendered female. And I even used to do this with my seminary classes. I'd pick the biggest, buffest boy and the smallest, slightest girl and have them come up and ask them to have an arm wrestle in front of the class where both of them had to try as hard as they could. I didn't want either party to take it easy on the other. Well, the class was kind of up in arms. Like, that's not fair. It's not fair. I said, exactly. It isn't fair. But what if I intercede? What if I help one side overpower the other? That's what Jesus does. The intent of his last sacrifice is to bring about the bowels of mercy. Interesting he'd use that phrase, the bowels, the intestines of mercy, the guts. Well, in ancient Israelite culture, that was as important as the heart. I mean, your gut is still a place where we feel things deeply, right? I've got this gut feeling. Well, the, the feeling of mercy down in the guts, the bowels of mercy, they, they yearn to help, to come to aid, to succor. And it's those feelings of mercy that overpower this more clinical sense of justice. It's Valjean overpowering Javert. It's the little girl overpowering the big guy because someone else intercedes and helps that overpowering occur. Those are the means that are brought about so that we can all have this beautiful phrase. He repeats it several times. Faith unto repentance. This is the fourth article of faith, right? With each element connected to its neighbors. Remember when they organized the church and they talked about being baptized unto repentance? We are in this cycle now. Well, here it's faith unto repentance. It goes both ways. My beliefs drive my behaviors and my behaviors confirm my beliefs. That's why faith leads to repentance, belief to behavior. But also why baptism leads to the gift of the Holy Ghost, behavior leading to belief, covenant leading to confirmation. You see why repentance can't stand alone? It has to be faith unto repentance. I know I must repent and I know I can repent because I know Jesus. His perfection, coming to know him, is what convinces me that I want to repent. The pedestal is so high, I just want to climb and ascend to be with him. But his mercy looking down is what draws me up, knowing that I'm allowed to. In fact, through him, I'm enabled to. That's his grace. 
If I have faith in Christ, then I have confidence to repent through Christ. And thus, verse 16, mercy can satisfy the demands of justice. This is why God won't be angry like we assumed him to be back in chapter 33. He can be merciful. Justice is satisfied. Mercy can encircle us in the arms of safety. Oh, how oft would I have gathered you as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings. Those are the arms of safety. For some reason, as a boy, I don't have a lot of memories of my dad sitting next to me in church because he was always up on the stand. But those few memories that I do have of him sitting on the pew with us, if I ever got to sit next to him, which we kind of fought over because he usually had Skittles in his suit coat pocket, and so we'd fold our arms and casually reach in and kind of <coughs> cough and get some snacks during a sacrament meeting. But in more reverent moments, I remember sitting next to my dad and, there'd be, and leaning forward. I was probably just tired. And I remember him putting his hand on my back. My dad has massive hands. The kind I'd have to kind of pump myself up for before giving him a big handshake. And then I'd just be able to kind of wrap my fingertips and thumb tip around him a little bit big hands. And when his hand was on my back, I could feel it. There was just this, I don't know, this comforting weight. And that feeling is what I think of when I ponder being encircled about in the arms of safety. There's just this weight of safety, of security, of protection under the wing of our mother hen. Meanwhile, those that exercise no faith unto repentance. Notice he didn't say, just because they didn't repent. No, you'll never have one without the other. It's they didn't repent because they didn't have faith unto repentance. It's not lack of repentance alone that damns us. It's our lack of faith that makes us believe that repentance is possible to begin with. Those that exercise no faith unto repentance are exposed to the whole law of the demands of justice. Would you rather be encircled or exposed? Therefore, only unto him that has faith unto repentance, third time in a row he said that, is brought about the great and eternal plan of redemption. Therefore, so with all of this in mind, may God grant unto you, it's a gift, my brethren, may he grant it unto you, that ye may begin to exercise. There's that same word Alma used. Exercising a particle of faith so you can start to believe. Well, how about exercising that faith so that now you repent? It's not faith alone that we're after. It's not just an, an acquiescence or even an acknowledgement of belief. It's a change of behavior. It's becoming like Christ, not just acknowledging that he's real. Exercise your faith unto repentance. Begin to call upon his holy name, that he would have mercy upon you. Those are the means that the atonement has brought about. In fact, back to that thought of the gendered male justice and female mercy, but the woman wins out. Mercy overpowers, such a strong verb. Mercy overpowers justice. Think about the story of David and Abigail in 1 Samuel chapter 25. When Abigail's husband, Nabal, has acted like the fool his name means him to be. And David is ready to come in and slaughter him until Abigail runs out and intercedes. She is the type of Christ in this story. She is mercy personified and she's female, kneeling before an overpowering and angry David who doesn't shy away from giants, let alone some fool that treated him in the wrong way. What could Abigail possibly do? She herself knows that her husband is guilty. She confesses as much. But three verses worth remembering, three phrases from these verses. First, she says to him, Upon me, my Lord, upon me let this iniquity be. So let me take my husband's place. Once the sin has been transferred, she then says, I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thine handmaid. Picture David saying, but it's not yours. How could I be mad at you? You're not the one that did it. Exactly. How can I be mad at the person? The sin no longer belongs to them. Jesus has taken it upon him. It's him now kneeling before me, asking me to forgive him. And how can I withhold forgiveness from the great forgiver? Finally, in 31, then she says, 
that this shall be no grief unto thee, nor offense of heart unto my Lord, either that thou hast shed blood causeless, or that my Lord hath avenged himself. So whether my husband deserves this or not, whether you have every reason or no reason to do this, forgive me so that no offense will come upon you, no grief, no regret that you retaliated. Deserved or undeserved, I'm trying to save you from the burdens of justice, even when you're the one administering it rather than receiving it. And David acquiesces. His strong arm is overpowered by the meekness of Abigail. Mercy overpowereth justice and brings about means that we can have faith unto repentance all through Jesus Christ. Now back to verse 17 where he says to call upon his holy name. That's all that Zenus was talking about, right? You can pray to God anywhere and everywhere. Well, now Amulek gives his version of that. Verse 18, yea, cry unto him for mercy, for he is mighty to save. Notice, by the way, that the verb is typically cry. It's not just, and pray for mercy. It's cry. That's what babies do. Infants that are totally dependent upon their parent cry unto God for mercy. He's mighty to save. Yea, humble yourselves. Continue in prayer unto him. You see the humble prayer, the continuous prayer we saw in Zenus' as well? Cry unto him when ye are in your fields, yea, over all your flocks. Location doesn't matter. Cry unto him in your houses, yea, over all your household. And do it all the time, morning, midday, evening, this constancy in prayer. Yea, cry unto him against the power of your enemies. Yea, cry unto him against the devil, who is an enemy to all righteousness. Cry unto him over the crops of your fields, that ye may prosper in them. I know for you, Zoramite poor, this would make a huge difference. Not necessarily that your crops would prosper, but that you would prosper in them. Trust me, I don't want you to become as prideful and materialistic as the people that cast you out. So be careful about praying for prosperity in general. Rather, pray to prosper in whatever you have been given. Whatever circumstance you might find yourself in, prosper within that. That's a safe prosperity. Verse 25, cry over the flocks of your fields that they may increase. And not just increase for you. We'll see that in a second. Verse 26, this is not all. You must pour out your souls in your closets, in your secret places, in your wilderness. Again, who cares about the synagogue you can't go into? You shouldn't want to go there once you know what's happening inside. If you think that's the only place where you can worship God, well, that is one place where God is not being worshipped. Verse 27, when you do cry unto the Lord, let your hearts be full drawn out in prayer unto him continually for your welfare, that's the flocks and the crops and the herds and so on, but also for the welfare of those who are around you. That's why you want your flocks to increase. So you have more than enough for yourself. Not so that you can keep spending the excess on yourself, but so that you can then share with those that are in even lesser circumstances than you are. You see, this is so similar to what King Benjamin taught about those who were begging for forgiveness. Well, you better not turn a blind eye to those who are begging you for assistance either. In 28, my beloved brother, and I say unto you, do not suppose that this is all. For after ye have done all these things, if you turn away the needy and the naked, and visit not the sick and afflicted, and in part of your substance, if ye have, I know many of you don't, but if you would give, if you did have, again, that's King Benjamin too, I say unto you, if you do not any of these things, behold, your prayer is vain. Vain as in self-centered and vain as in unavailing. It availeth you nothing. Ye are as hypocrites who deny the faith. Hypocrisy because you are asking for mercy, but not offering it. Praying for mercy, but not practicing it. This is the parable of the unmerciful servant. If you can have faith in your repentance, can't you have faith in their repentance too? If you can have faith in God's mercy for you, can you extend that mercy to others? 29, if you do not remember to be charitable, ye are as dross. That's what you were feeling before, right? They treated them as dross because of the coarseness of their apparel. Well, then let me show you what real dross is. Dross isn't a matter of not having. Dross is a matter of not sharing. Talk about turning the tables. Verse 30, my brethren, I would that after you have received so many witnesses... Almas, 
Zenus's, Zenix, Moses's, mine, seeing that the Holy Scriptures testify of these things. Come forth, bring fruit unto repentance. Speaking of seeds and trees and fruit, fruit unto repentance. Isn't that sweet and white and pure and delicious? 31, yea, I would that ye would come forth and harden not your hearts any longer. That needs to change. And it needs to change now. For behold, now is the time and the day of your salvation. Notice these are all singular words. You don't have days and times. You have day, today. You have time, right now. This is his turn to reteach what Alma taught back in chapter 12. Your time was prolonged. You were given a day. Use it. Therefore, if you will repent and harden not your hearts, immediately shall the great plan of redemption be brought about unto you. I love this. The gears are turning. Faith is engaging the wheel of repentance, which engages the wheel of baptism, of making covenants, which engages the wheel of confirmation, the power of the Holy Ghost, which in return speeds up the velocity, the power of those covenants, which baptism unto repentance keeps us wanting to change and increases and confirms our faith throughout it all. That's the process. That's the plan. And the moment we start moving with it instead of fighting against it is the moment that it begins to work in our behalf. Immediately, the great plan of redemption is brought about unto you. I love that. It's the snatch moment that Alma kept talking about. How quickly the Lord can come with his merciful forgiveness and abundant grace. The moment we stop fighting against the plan it starts working on our behalf. You can start to feel that swelling, that enlargement, that tasting that delicious fruit the moment we begin. Verse 32, Behold, this life, that's all we got, is the time for men to prepare to meet God. Yea, behold, the day, singular, of this life, singular, is the day, singular, for men to perform their labors. In the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. You don't get tomorrow, right now. Now, as I said unto you before, as ye have had so many witnesses, therefore I beseech of you that you do not procrastinate the day of your repentance until the end. Remember, we talked about that. This tension between the Lord prolonging our days, lengthening our time to give us time to repent, but also trying to hasten the work and shorten those days because it's only getting harder to do so. So don't procrastinate. It's only making it worse for all of us. For after this day of life, which is given us to prepare for eternity, behold, if we do not improve our time while in this life. Notice the verb. We talk about filling time. Worse, we talk about killing time. No, we need to improve time and do it in this life because then cometh the night of darkness wherein there can be no labor performed. 34 and 35 seem to suggest that deathbed repentance doesn't seem to work. You cannot say when you are brought to that awful crisis that I will repent. I don't know if the awful crisis is death or judgment. They both have some similarities. But it's not a matter of repenting right then at that moment. It's like Elder Hale said about his father as he was approaching death. And he asked him if he had anything to repent of. And his father smiled and said, Oh, I've been repenting all along. To be in the habit of repentance, of being baptized unto repentance and exercising faith unto repentance, that that wheel is always moving. Then we've established our direction and built our momentum and our continued progress is ensured throughout the eternities. No damnation there. Whereas if we never built up the momentum to begin with, it's almost like this life is meant to establish our trajectory and our velocity. And with that trajectory and velocity, the next life allows it to continue on eternally. But if there is no trajectory and no velocity, and then we just allow it to go, it still doesn't move, no matter how much time we give it. If we have chosen that stubbornness, that hardness of heart, that unyielding slothfulness. See, if a sloth won't move, then time's not going to change it. The rest of us, if we're at least moving, if we're exercising particles of faith and exercising faith unto repentance, then that will continue 
No need for it ever to come to an end. That's the spirit we've developed. Those are the righteous reflexes that we've developed in ourselves. Trajectory and velocity. As opposed to a spirit of stagnation, of damnation. You see, we cannot say that we'll change, that we'll return to God, because we never really said that in this life. Then is not the time to start working on new vocabulary. He says, nay, ye cannot say this, for that same spirit which doth possess your bodies at the time that ye go out of this life. That same spirit will have power to possess your body in that eternal world. Is ours a slothful spirit or an anxiously engaged one? Is it the spirit of procrastination or the spirit of faith unto repentance? In a bigger picture, is it the spirit of the Lord that we have grown accustomed to yielding to or the spirit of the devil that has sealed us his? That's what he says in 35. If ye have procrastinated the day of your repentance, even until death, behold, ye have become subjected to the spirit of the devil. So it's not just your own lazy spirit primarily. It's the spirit of the devil that he's talking about. And if he seals you his, such that the spirit of the Lord hath withdrawn from you and hath no place in you. Remember Alma said, give place for a portion of these words. Well, there's no room. It's all been crowded out with weeds and rocks. Nothing's growing here. You can give that patch the rest of eternity and still nothing's going to grow. The devil has all power over you and this is the final state of the wicked. Now again, section 138 of the Doctrine and Covenants should give us hope for the spirit world and the opportunity for faith and repentance and covenant making and confirmation of truth to continue there for both those who never knew and those who did. Again, reread section 138. The teaching and progression continues on for all, both paradise and prison, it seems kind of makes the spirit world this liminal space between this life and eternity. The Book of Mormon doesn't seem to deal with the spirit world much. It's more of the now and then, the ultimate. And so the question is, which side of the line do we associate the spirit world with? If this life is given us to prepare for eternity, does the spirit world count more as this life or count more as eternity? That's kind of the question. Either way, Amulek's point is don't assume that you'll get it done later. Do it now. Change. If you're hesitating, if you're procrastinating, it may be less about your perspective on repentance and more about your faith in Christ and his mercy. You can repent. You can change. God is not angry. You don't have to be afraid of coming unto him. Search the scriptures. Engage in real prayer. Come to know a loving, merciful Father because of his Son. And with that faith in Christ, how can you not have faith unto repentance? The plan of salvation was made to work for you, not against you. So yield to it. It's that simple. Look and live. And immediately, immediately, it will work in your favor. 36, the reality is that the Lord cannot dwell in unholy temples. He can only dwell in the hearts of the righteous. So become righteous through repentance. It's the righteous that sit down in the kingdom that never have to leave. It's those whose garments are made white through the blood of the Lamb. Made white. They weren't white all along. All have fallen. All were hardened. We all need that help. 37, now my beloved brethren... I desire that ye should remember these things and that ye should work out your salvation with fear before God. Not fear of his anger, but fear of offending his mercy. Don't deny the coming of Christ. Denying it for whatever reason. Denying it because you don't think you need it and you've all been elect to be saved because you're better than your brethren. Or deny it because you don't want it to happen. You don't want threats of judgment hanging over you. You want to do whatever you want to do. 38, contend no more against the Holy Ghost. Quit fighting him. Just yield. Receive it. Take upon you the name of Christ. Humble yourselves to the dust. Yes, even you poor have more room to descend. Worship God in whatsoever place you may be in. Who cares about the synagogue? But do it in spirit and in truth. That's the phrase that Jesus used how you do it, not so much where. And live in thanksgiving daily. Don't just say thanks. Live in thanksgiving and do it constantly. Thankful for the many mercies and blessings which he doth bestow upon you. I don't stop there. 39, 
I exhort you, my brethren, that ye be watchful unto prayer continually. That's why you need to be able to do it from place to place to place. Because the adversary can attack you in the synagogue or the field or the house or even the closet. So pray continually that you may not be led away by the temptations of the devil. That he may not overpower you. We'd much rather have mercy overpower justice than the devil overpower a saint. That you may not become his subjects at the last day. For behold, he rewardeth you no good thing. Alma taught that earlier too. That we receive our wages of him whom we list to obey. And now, my beloved brethren, I would exhort you to have patience and that ye bear with all manner of afflictions. Kind of bookending how Alma started this whole discourse. The afflictions that had humbled them. Be patient in them. Bear them. They're doing you more good than harm. Don't revile against those who cast you out because of your exceeding poverty. They did you a favor with that too. It kept you from becoming prideful like them. It kept you from becoming a sinner like them. It kept you from worshiping self under the guise of worshiping God. Instead, verse 41, have patience. Bear with those afflictions with a firm hope that ye shall one day rest from all your afflictions, resting under the shade tree of your own tree of life. Now, when Amulek finished what his companion Alma had started, we see its aftermath in chapter 35. Very brief chapter. In verse 1 and 2, the missionaries go home. Actually, they come to Jershon. I love that. After having spent this time among difficult, less actives, dissenters. Remember, Alma kept praying, please comfort us because we will suffer because of the sins of the people that we'll be working with. So where do they go? Even before they go home, they go hang out in the land of Jershon. Can I just spend some time with the anti-Nephi-Lehi's? Reactivation can be draining because so much of it is willful ignorance and a hardness of heart, a stubbornness against the word, a rejection of things that were taught bountifully to them. So to spend time with recent converts, anti-Nephi-Lehi's who are on fire with the gospel, that's comforting. So they go and they spend time there. Now in verse 3, notice what's happening back among the Zoramites. The more popular part of them, the ones that ascended the holy stand most readily, they consult together concerning the words which were preached. They're angry because of the word, because it destroys their craft. What craft? Well, their priest craft. They're saying that we're not better than everyone else. They're saying our costly apparel is actually worse than their coarse apparel. They're puncturing holes in our prosperity gospel. And that ruins our priestcraft. So they won't hearken unto the words. Go figure. But in verse 4 and 5, they trick the people into divulging where they are on all this. They kind of want to coax out of them their true colors. Well, what do you guys think? I don't know. I'm, I'm undecided. So in 4, they gather everyone together in that area and ask what they think about the words that were spoken. Verse 5, they didn't let them know concerning their desires. They wanted to find out the minds of the people privily. But once they find out in verse 6, knowing who's in favor of the words which were spoken by Alma and who isn't, who's on our side and who's on theirs, those believers are then cast out of the land. That's the bad news. But then the good news. And they were many. I love that. The multitudes of the poor. Those in a preparation to receive the word having begun to exercise a particle of faith, to be reminded of things that they had been taught bountifully before their dissension. Many believed. And when they're cast out, where do they go? They go to Jershon too. Newly reactivated members, being strengthened and comforted and ministered to by recent convert members. I think there's something just special about that. I've been a member longer than you have. I should be the one welcoming and ministering to you. But you're the one confirming my newly refound faith. Verse 7, Alma and his brethren minister unto them. But as so often happens, dissension from dissenters is simply not allowed. Again, it gives the lie to their lies. How dare, we already left them. How dare you go back? You see, the story of the prodigal son would be hated by anyone who chose to remain in the far country. So in 8, they're angry. They were already angry at the people they cast out. That's why they gave them the boot. But now they're angry at the people of Jershon for accepting them. This is so similar to what we saw earlier 
when the anti-Nephi-Lehites themselves converted, and the Amulonites and the Amalekites were so angry by this that they riled up all the Lamanites to go fight the anti-Nephi-Lehites, then to go fight, take it out on the Nephites, that's when they destroyed Ammonihah, then take it out on new converts that were finally listening to Aaron's words. It's just so interesting. Remember, you don't look inward, so you find a scapegoat wherever you can look. And that's what they decide to do. Verse 8, their leader, a very wicked man, sends over to the people of Ammon, desiring that they should cast out of their land all those that came over from them into their land. They breathed out many threatenings against them. But they picked the wrong group of people to threaten. We don't even care about your swords. We look at death itself with no degree of terror. We're not going to send these newly reactivated members back to the wolves. Are you kidding? The people of Ammon did not fear their words. Therefore, they did not cast them out. They did receive all the poor of the Zoramites that came over unto them. They nourished them. They clothed them. They gave unto them lands for their inheritance. See that? They're doing for them just what the Nephites had done for them when they came into the land. They administered unto them according to their wants. And that made the Zoramites even angrier than ever, verse 10. And so what do they do? They begin mixing with the Lamanites. They stir them up to anger. Same old, same old. And in 11, they start making preparations for war. War that will define the rest of the book of Alma. This is where we start to see the war chapters unfold. Now, probably reading the writing on the wall, and perhaps at the direction of someone like Ammon, in verse 13, the people of Ammon, the anti nephi Lehi's, decided to leave the land of Jershon for good. That had been their first inheritance among the Nephites. The Nephites had protected them at incredible cost to themselves. And so they decide, you know, let's go to a place of perhaps even greater safety. Safety for us and perhaps less of a potential problem for the Nephite armies that are going to protect us. If this is too close to the Lamanites, let's get further away from them. And so they do. They move to Melek, which is where the righteous from Ammonihah had gone when they were cast out, including Zeezrom. And they clear out the land of Jershon so the armies of the Nephites can have a place to contend with the armies of the Lamanites. Like, this seems to be a battleground. Why don't we move? Perhaps our presence here is exacerbating the problem, so let's remove ourselves. After they do, then in verse 14, Alma, Ammon, their brethren, the two sons of Alma, they return to the land of Zarahemla after having been instruments in the hands of God of bringing many of the Zoramites to repentance because they taught them faith in Christ. And that faith led to repentance. As many as were brought to repentance were driven out of their land, but they have lands for their inheritance in the land of Jershon. So that's interesting. The Zoramite converts didn't follow the anti nephi Lehi's all the way to Melek. They stayed in Jershon. And that was okay for them because they hadn't made a covenant not to fight. So they actually stayed and took up arms to defend themselves and their wives and children and their lands. So they'll be able to join the Nephite armies in fighting their former comrades among the Zoramites. Verse 15 and 16 then conclude this lesson. Now Alma being grieved for the iniquity of his people. We've seen that a lot from him. Pained, sickened, sorrowful, grieving, because he knows what that iniquity will bring them. He's felt it himself when he was on that side of the Lord's line. Grieve for the wars and bloodsheds. Grieve for the contentions which were among them. He'd been to declare the word. He did all that he could. Some listened, some would not. Softened hearts received the word, hardened hearts rejected it. He'd sent to declare the word among all the people in every city, but he'd seen that the hearts of the people began to wax hard, that they began to be offended because of the strictness of the word. That irony. We've been teaching mercy the whole time. You still only hear the strictness of the word? You really want the easy universalism of the order of the Nehors? No wonder they seem to be popular for the rest of the Book of Mormon so easy on the ears. No matter how much we preach mercy, the fact that we don't uncouple it from its contrary, justice, that's still too scary for you. It's still too strict. You want mercy uncoupled from justice. And that mercy is no longer merciful. It's enabling. It's excusing. It's rationalizing. It's justifying. It's damning. That's not merciful. Because we refuse to allow the jack-in-the-box to be stuffed down into its box. But every time, 
we try to fill that gap, not with guilt, but with grace, knowing that you can change. We're teaching faith unto repentance. But all you hear is an angry God. That's a God of your invention. All you see is an arm of anger instead of an arm of safety. All you feel is fear instead of faith. Strictness of the word, strict only if you refuse to hear the mercy that surrounds it. We have to hear them both. This is a harmony. What a tragedy that you only hear one tune. No wonder his heart is exceedingly sorrowful. So what does he do? This is interesting. And this will lead into next week's chapters. Therefore he caused that his sons should be gathered together, that he might give unto them every one his charge, separately, concerning the things pertaining unto righteousness. That is the account, according to his own record, that we will study for the next two weeks. And those are amazing conversations between father and sons. I love that Alma does this. He's tried everything and gone everywhere, and he still sees hardened hearts. So does he throw in the towel? Think these people are just beyond saving? No, he continues to teach, but where does he focus his next efforts? At home, where it's going to matter most. I'm grateful for all the preaching from the pulpit that we receive in the church, but I'm most grateful for the instruction I received at home from parents who knew. And for all the teaching I get to do, I have five students that I've taught more lessons to than anyone else. I hope they're learning them. The more I can build their faith, the less chance there will be that someone else has to go out and reclaim them later. I know it's not all up to me. There is nature as well as nurture. There is personal choice as well as parenting. There is agency. But I do pray that they know that they'll exercise a particle of faith, that they've come to trust a God who is merciful toward them. Brothers and sisters, today's the day. This is the day and this is the time to prepare, to prepare ourselves, to prepare our families, to prepare the world so that when the Son of Man returns, he will find faith upon the earth and not just little seeds, but a forest of trees of life tended by gardeners who have grown up to be like him.